four National League teams to win an interleague game last night, beating the Rangers in Texas. The other three American League teams all won at home. Checking today's schedule now, it's a full schedule of interleague play. And there's one final already. The Brewers in front of a... It's been 11 years now, so maybe you don't clearly remember the last time the Red Sox took a meaningful trip to Shea Stadium. Or maybe you still remember every excruciating detail. That was back when interleague play meant it had to be either March or October. But not anymore. Fresh off two straight wins against the best team in their own league, the Sox open in New York tonight against one of the surprise teams in that other league. Sports presents Boston Red Sox baseball tonight from Chase Stadium in New York. The Red Sox begin interleague play as they take on the New York Mets in game one of a three-game series. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sean McDonough along with Jerry Remy. It's great to have you with us as the Red Sox go for their third straight win, and they'll try to do it against the Mets. It seems fitting that the Red Sox are back at Shea Stadium for the first time in 11 years on Friday the 13th. And Jerry will talk a lot about interleague play as the night goes along, but for the fans, it's a concept most of them have wanted in an exciting time. I think so, Sean, and if tonight's any evidence of it, there's plenty of people here in the stands to watch this ball game, and I think the first time around, it is going to be very exciting for fans. The Red Sox tonight get to face the Mets, a team that's been a surprise in the National League. There's seven games over 500, and the reason they've done that because of pitching. They've got three pitches in the top ten in ERA. They've also played much better defense this year. Last year, they were last in the league. This year, they're second in the league, and one of the reasons they're playing so well is because the guy we're familiar with in the American League, John Ola, 326 average, 11 home runs, 46 RBI. He's had a very nice bounce back season here with the New York Mets, and he is basically the whole offense. He and catcher Todd Hundley. He had had a couple of down years after leading the American League in hitting back in 1993. More news on the Red Sox front once again tonight. Wilfredo Cordero will not be in the lineup. As a matter of fact, he did not accompany the team from the hotel to the ballpark. There was some thought, Jerry, that after the team left Fenway Park, perhaps he'd get back into action here in New York tonight. That's not going to happen. No, that's what the Red Sox were saying last night, that Cordero would probably play in this series in New York and probably tonight. But uh, Cordero did accompany the team here to New York. He was on the charter flight last night. But this afternoon, for some reason, they decided to leave him at the hotel. So he's not even at the ballpark and probably won't play. As I said a couple of nights ago, I think it's going to be a while before we see Will Cordero play baseball again. Still a day-to-day -day situation for Cordero. It'll be Jeff Supon on the mound tonight for the Red Sox as they first game ever in interleague play. But first, back to our 68 Sports Studios. Here's Doug Brown. Okay, Sean and Jerry, thanks guys very much. And of course, the game is coming up momentarily from New York. Of course, a lot of interesting questions about the lineup for tonight for Jimmy Williams because there is no DH with this game being played in the National League Park. The Mets have won eight of their last 13 games. They are a very surprising seven games over 500. As Jerry mentioned, they're only six and a half games behind the first place Atlanta Braves with the Marlins in between. Tonight's starting pitchers are brought to you by your New England Ford dealers, and the pitchers will hit in this series, remember. Jeff Supon will try to come off his worst outing of the season. He was tagged for five runs in just two innings against Cleveland on Sunday. Rick Reed is also coming off his worst outing of the year, but he has been very good for the Mets this year. He's sixth in the National League in earned run average. He's gone through the sixth inning in all 11 of his starts this year. The game is coming up from New York. Come right back on Red Sox Baseball. 68 Sports presents Boston. Welcome back to Red Sox Baseball. Doug Brown along with Butch Stearns in our Red Sox studio. Sean and Jerry will be by with the game shortly. The opening ceremonies, of course, with the first interleague game going a little bit longer at Shea Stadium tonight. So it gives us a little bit of a chance to get you ready for tonight's game and talk about the lineup, which is a very interesting element, of course, with the pitchers batting in the National <coughs> League Park. So we're going to get to see Jeff Supon take some swings. Who knows when the last time was he did that in a serious situation. Well, I haven't really caught on to interleague baseball. I mean, the Giants in Texas game the other night, it was okay. The highlights were good. I liked and Barry Bonds in the American League Park. But now with the team that I grew up watching, we did the Red Sox, and seeing Supon have to hit 
at this time and seeing them playing in Ashley Park. Now I've got some interest. I'm really anticipating this well, game. Well, plus, right it, you knew it had to be the Mets. I mean, when the East was going <laughs> to face the East this year, poetic justice. It, it either had to be poetic justice for the Red Sox to open up against the Mets or the Braves, the team that left here. By the way, is Steven rushing at first base for the Red Sox tonight? I don't believe so, no. I, neither is Bill Buckner, so don't worry. Uh, so let's talk about this lineup that Jimmy Williams has put together. It's very, very interesting. Uh, Garcia Parra is leading off. That's the same. Darren Bragg is in the number two spot again. Mm -hmm. Mo Vaughn is batting third. Nairing is in the cleanup spot tonight. No Reggie Jefferson. Shane Mack gets to play defense again tonight for the Sox. Reggie Jefferson sits out. Very interesting. Well, Reggie, of course, will be the first bat off the bench or the guy in a clutch situation. The guy's got seven hits in the last two games against the Orioles. He's got three doubles last night. Four lefties in the lineup tonight against Rick Reed, the right-handed pitcher. Supon, of course, hitting down at the end of it. And Nairing batting cleanup. No surprise if you're going to keep Reggie on the bench. He's their best RBI guy this year. The other interesting thing about the lineup is Scott Hatterberg batting fifth, which is as high as he's been in the lineup all year. We've We've got some numbers here to look at now for the New York Mets uh, to show statistically. Sean and Jerry were talking about how much they have improved, not only in their record, but also in a lot of different statistical categories this year. You can see the rankings right now. They're in the top half, if you will, of all the National League uh, major statistical categories. Hitting 262, that's uh, a significant increase. Runs per game is way up from last year. Home runs, they're hitting home runs. Uh, nobody but Todd Hundley was hitting them last year. Now they've got other guys hitting them as well, including John Olrood. Stolen bases, they're hanging in there. But of course, the big thing, as always, is the pitching. We've talked about the starters. We talked about it earlier on Red Sox. On well, you day. know what's funny about those numbers? If you're a numbers type of person, and you've been watching baseball numbers all year, those standing by themselves, that right-hand column, aren't impressive at all. But... <laughs> That's the National League. They don't hit home runs. They don't hit for average over there, and they don't give up a lot of runs either. All right, Butch, thanks very much. This is going to be very interesting and a lot of fun, I have a feeling, tonight. The first interleague game for the Red Sox. It's at Shea Stadium, and standing by ready to bring it to you are Sean McDonough and Jerry Remy. Guys? Thank you, gentlemen. Welcome back to Shea Stadium, everyone, where they have just finished introducing the starting lineups as they would for a World Series game. The teams coming out to their respective foul lines. They were introduced by Mike Frances and Chris Russo of WFAN Radio here in New York, two very popular sports talk show hosts who share a program. They expect a big crowd here tonight, about 40,000 expected to be on hand. The attendance might be diminished somewhat by the fact that we've had some off and on rain showers here this afternoon. A pretty heavy thunderstorm hit this area the middle of the afternoon. But the crowd is filing in a crowd of 40,000 would be more than double what the Mets have been averaging. They're averaging just under 19,000 per home date. Time now for our national anthem to be sung by Toby Skyer. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watch were so gallantly overhead to diminish her singing a couple of jets have been roaring over Shea Stadium and you'll hear them from time to time during the ball game tonight the fans pouring in for this first interleague game for the Red Sox and the New York Mets and tonight's starting lineups are brought to you by your friendly New England Dodge dealers the more things change the more things look like the new Dodge. 
for the Red Sox as they go for their third straight win. Nomar Garcia Pirate leads off and plays shortstop. Darren Bragg is once again in right field. Mo Vaughn at first base. The cleanup hitter, third baseman Tim Nering. Scott Hatterberg bats fifth in interleague play and is the catcher. John Ballenden at second base. Troy O'Leary hits seventh. Shane Mack, the center fielder, bats eighth. And the pitchers will bat in the National League Park. It's Jeff Supon, the pitcher, batting ninth. Umpires out at home plate going over the ground rules. Of course, the Red Sox will need a refresher course in the ground rules, given that they're not accustomed to playing here at Chase Stadium. And there isn't a lot about this ballpark that's complicated. National League umpires in the National League Park. Ed Rapuano behind the plate. Terry Tata at first. C.B. Buckner at second and Jerry Davis at third. We were talking with Jimmy Williams about Shea Stadium last night. And he said, really, it's a symmetrical ballpark. Not a lot to have to deal with or learn as a player who is not accustomed to playing here. Wilfredo Cordero, one of the few Red Sox players who had played in this ballpark during his time in the National League, but he is not here tonight. 338 down the left and right field foul lines, 371 to the power alleys, and 410. Two straightaway center. Very little breeze to speak of on a hazy night in New York. As Jim Williams says if you can play at Fenway with all the nooks and crannies and strange bounces, then adjusting to this ballpark shouldn't take very long. Pretty basic ballpark. It's almost uh, like one of the spring training facilities uh, as far as the layout goes. Uh, very symmetrical around the outfield. And the Mets have taken the field in their home white uniforms. And they have Rick Reed on the mound tonight. Rick Reed making his uh, 12th appearance of the season. I should say his 14th appearance. And it's going to be his 12th start. A record of 4-3 and three with a 2.23 ERA. That is sixth best in the National League. As we mentioned, the Mets have three pitches in the top ten in ERA. And uh, Rick Reed number six. Excellent control on the 11 walks and 80 and two thirds innings. Uh, that is the best in the National League. Had a two game winning streak stopped last time against Cincinnati. And has, uh, has pitched against the Red Sox in the past. Uh, back in 1992, he was a member of the Royals, as we see Mokey Wilson, who threw out the first pitch here tonight. Wow. They've done everything they possibly can to rub it in. Yes, yeah. they have. Earlier tonight, about a half an hour before the first pitch, they were playing a highlight tape of the 1986 World Series on their Diamond Vision scoreboard out there in left center. Now they have Mookie Wilson throw out the first ball. A reminder of 1986 in the World Series, the last time the Red Sox played a game that meant anything here. They played an exhibition game here in 1987. Defense is brought to you by Hoover. Nobody gets the dirt like Hoover. Nobody. And as Jerry mentioned, at the top of the telecast, the Mets are second in the National League in team fielding at 982. Only 44 errors in 63 games. Only Colorado is better in the National League. Bernard Gilkey in left. Carl Everett in center. Alex Ochoa in right field. Matt Franco playing third. Luis Lopez at short. Carlos Baerga at second. John Olerud at first. And Todd Hundley. Handles the tosses of Rick Reed. A lot of injuries on the left side of that Mets infield. That's their major concern at the moment. Ray Ordonez, the brilliant fielding shortstop, out with an injury. And his replacement had been the former Oriole, Manny Alexander, who had been filling in capably. And Alexander hurt his knee and underwent surgery today. They were going to start. A 32 year old rookie named Sean Gilbert at shortstop tonight but he has an infected knee. So they're down to their fourth choice at short in Luis Lopez and Matt Franco's ordinarily a bench player as well starting at third tonight. Ready to go for the first pitch of interleague play ever involving the Red Sox and the New York Mets and it'll be Nomar Garcia Pyro to lead off. Hitting 289 with eight homers. He hit two last night in the win over the Orioles and 32 runs batted in for Nomar. He swings at the first pitch, chopped it down to third, and Franco to all the route for the out. Well, one pitch and one out for the Red Sox in interleague play. This idea stinks. Let's stop it right now and go home. Tonight's game is <laughs> here's a good idea. Part of the Cap Cure home run challenge. Each home run hit during the game will mean at least $40,000 will go to Cap Cure. And its mission is to find a cure for prostate cancer. 
now the most diagnosed cancer in the nation. If you'd like information about reducing the risk of prostate cancer, call 1-800-547-CURE, C-U-R-E. One of those planes we've talked about. Roaring overhead. First pitch from Reed to Darren Bragg, a called strike. Bragg on the verge of going back over 300. At 299, six homers and 23 runs batted in. And he pulls that down the right field line. Foul. By a couple of feet. He's in the hole 0 and 2. I think we'll probably see a lot of the Red Sox hitters going early in the count tonight because, uh, as I mentioned, Rick Reed. So far this season has had the best control in the National League. And the Red Sox at an immediate disadvantage of course uh, not having the DH Reggie Jefferson who's been one of the hottest hitters for the Red Sox not in the starting lineup. Well, he can't play first as Mulvon is there and Reggie really hasn't been working out at all on the outfield. He's not a good outfielder defensively so he's the odd man out tonight. And Bragg takes the fastball for strike three. So Darren's down on three pitches. And there are quickly two down in the Red Sox first. Reed will move the ball around, the fastball, the curveball, the changeup, not afraid to come inside on left handers, and that's how he picks up the strikeout against Darren Bragg. Mo Vaughn, the batter, at 3.30, 19 homers, 42 runs batted in. He had another homer last night. And he hits a ground ball to second. Bobbled for a while by Bayerga, but he recovered in plenty of time to throw out Mo Vaughn. And Rick Reed had an easy one, two, three first. After a half inning, no score on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. It's Leading off and playing center field, Carl Everett. Batting second in left field, Bernard Gilkey. Batting third at first base, John Olerud. Todd Hundley is the catcher and cleanup hitter. Carlos Baerga, the second baseman. Matt Franco, the third baseman, bat sixth. Alex Ochoa is in right field. Luis Lopez, the shortstop. And Rick Reed, the pitcher, bats ninth. And for the Red Sox, the pitcher tonight will be Jeff Supon. Start number five for Supon. Still looking for his first decision. Last time out against the Cleveland Indians, only going two innings in that ball game, And uncharacteristically walking five guys. Uh, five walks and one strikeout. for the first time. Carl Everett swings to the first one, looks a long drive to right center, and that ball is gone. Well, so far, the return to Shea Stadium for the Red Sox has been almost as miserable as the experience the last time they were here in 1986 in a meaningful game. Home run number six on the season for Everett. He is playing center field. Lance Johnson has been on the Sable list with shin splints. And uh, Al Everett gives the Mets a very quick one to nothing lead. Bernard Gilkey takes the fastball up and in. And in two balls and no strikes. Sixth home run of the year for Everett. Supon's given up four 20 and two thirds innings. Fastball high. 3 and 0 oh on Gilkey, who has been struggling. He's up to the second spot in the batting order. Ordinarily, he hits fifth, but batting second with some of those other injuries that we talked about. Ball four, so a tough start for Supon. A first pitch home run by Everett, and then a four pitch walk to Gilkey. Looks like Supon rattled uh, right from the start after the home run, then can't throw a strike to Bernard Gilkey. Gilkey had been bothered some by a bad back, but they say that's not the reason his numbers aren't there. He just got off to a very slow start. John Olru, the batter. He 
takes the ball inside. Jerry mentioned Old Roots had a terrific bounce back year after a couple of down years with Toronto, which resulted in his being traded to the Mets with Toronto paying much of his salary. Jimmy Williams wants to go settle down Supon. Supon was looking toward the dugout like he couldn't believe that Jimmy Williams was coming out. Jimmy just trying to uh, break off the jam here, get a little time, get Supon relaxed. Well, not only has the return to New York and Shea Stadium been unpleasant for the Red Sox so far, it has been a great experience for us. I cannot hear a word you're saying, partner, so I'll just keep smiling and nodding at you, and I'm sure it's very interesting. Well, it's probably a good thing for you you can't hear a word I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, this headset is totally non-functioning. Oh, there it is. Now I can hear something. Old Rude, 10th in the league in hitting in the National League at 326. And he lines on a second caught by Valentinot of first for a double play. So whatever Jimmy Williams said, it was most insightful. As on the very next pitch, Supon gets the line drive into a double play. Two down to the bases now empty in the Mets first. Well, a break there for the Red Sox. This ball hit right on the button by John Olerud. And, uh, but fortunately for the Red Sox, right at John Valentin, he will easily double up Gilkey at first base. Hey, what the Mets uh, have come out swinging hard against uh, Supon here in the first inning. Well, Todd Hundley. He and Olrud provide the bulk of the Mets offense. Hundley at 299, 14 homers. That's a team high, and he's driven in 42 runs. Hundley seventh in the Amer in the National League, rather, in home runs. Fourth and slugging percentage at 614 behind only Larry Walker, Jeff Bagwell, and Andres Galarraga. If you look at this Mets lineup, it's old Root and Hundley that are doing uh, the bulk of the damage. A lot of low batting averages, but uh, not at those two spots. Well, it's hammered but foul into the seats and right. Jay Stadium continuing to fill up. It's a very pleasant night here. Went to the showers earlier. Humidity is diminished somewhat. And the temperature is in the mid 70s at game time. Hunley is swinging a miss. Four strike three, and that ends the inning. So the Mets settle for one run on the first pitch home run by Carl Everett. After one, one nothing New York on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. that went through Bill Buckner's legs on the screen out there in left center field. Yesterday's stars brought to you by Sam Adams, a better glass of beer. Nomar Garcia Parr is certainly one of yesterday's brightest stars. He had two homers in leading the Red Sox to their 9-5 victory over the Orioles. Stan Javier went three for four, including a home run for the Giants in the first interleague play game. The Giants beat the Texas Rangers four to three. And a nice job done by Jose Mercedes of Milwaukee last night, an emergency starter when Scott Carl was scratched. He gave up just two runs in eight innings against Cleveland as the Brewers beat the Indians six to two. Move back within three and a half of Cleveland in the AL Central. Yesterday's stars brought to you by Sam Adams. Rick Reed's first pitch of the second, a ball to Tim Nearing. The Red Sox trail one to nothing as they bat in the second against Rick Reed. Nearing at 283, eight homers, 34 runs batted in. And he looked at a ball outside. Nearing, Scott Hatterberg, and John Valentin do up. Fouled out of play to the right. Mentioned that Rick Reed has made 11 starts, and in uh, all of those starts, he's going at least six innings. Nearing pops it up shallow right. Bayerga is under it. One out. We pause now for station identification along the 68 Sports Red Sox television network. 
Sean McDonough with Jerry Remy. Tonight's game produced by John Wilson, directed by Tom Tedisco. First interleague play game for the Red Sox. And they trail the Mets one to nothing. Scott Hatterberg takes a belt high strike. Hatterberg at 262, three homers and 11 runs batted in. On the ground, right side, Old Rood flips to Reed. And there are quickly two down here in the second. Old Rood always a pretty smooth glove man around the first base bag. Well, the people around here can't say enough about what Old Rood has done to both defensively and offensively for the Mets team. As I mentioned, this team was the worst defensive team in the National League last year, and they've made incredible strides uh, in that department. And one of the reasons because of John Old Rood at first base. Ray's thrown only 11 pitches to get five outs. He's retired all five Boston hitters. John Valentin sends the 12th pitch of the night thrown by Reed out of play to the right. Well, Reed doesn't waste any time. He's right back on the rubber, ready to go, and he throws strikes. Valentin's average up over 250 now. It's been a long climb for John after that terrible start. Breaking ball missed. One ball and one strike. Two outs, bases empty. Second inning, one nothing New York on a leadoff home run by Carl Everett in the first, and the first pitch thrown by Supine. Valentin hits one in the air in left field. And Bernard Gilkey is there. After an inning and a half, one nothing Mets. We'll be right back after these words from your local stations. This is the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Bottom of the second inning, the Philadelphia Phillies come to friendly Fenway June 16th through the 18th for the Sox first series of interleague play at Fenway. I see history in the making. Plenty of seats are available. The tickets call 617-267-1700. Mets lead one to nothing. They have Carlos Bayerga ready to lead off against Jeff Supine and Matt Franco and Alex Ochoa. Bayerga got off to a dreadful start this year, but he's raised his average up to 294. Only two homers, 18 runs batted in. And a much better hitter left handed, batting 318 from the left as compared to just 189 from the right. First pitch of the inning from Supon, a fastball that missed. Kind of a disaster when Bayerga came over to the Mets. He had that uh, domino. Pull that uh, put him on a disabled list for a long time. Got off to a terrible start this season, but he really uh, got hot in May. Foul oh, ball over the Mets dugout. After the Mets game of April 28th, about a month into the season, Bayerga was hitting 161. And since then, he's hit 356 to raise his average to its current 294. On the ground right at Valentin. One out. It's amazing how Bayerga went from a guy who looked like he was a star player to a guy who looked like he was struggling to keep his major league career afloat. Hit heavy in his uh, time at uh, Cleveland was really out of shape and the Indians were not very happy about that. Got himself back in the shape in this offseason and uh, putting together some pretty good numbers. Looks more like the play he did early in his career with the Cleveland Indians. And he's spreading the word around the dugout exactly what Supon throws. These two teams do advance scout just as they would opponents within their league, but obviously they're more familiar from personal experience with pitchers in their own league. Matt Franco playing third base, batting 340, but that's in just 50 at bats. He's 17 for 50. And used almost exclusively as a pinch hitter, and he's been the best pinch hitter in the majors. Matt Franco batting 478 as a pinch hitter this year 11 for 23 including five hits in his last five pinch hit at bats. 
And 11 for his last 16 off the bench. But he's in the starting lineup tonight. And that's concern now is can they hang in there and continue to play above 500 ball with the injuries on the left side of the infield, particularly at shortstop. On the ground, base hit. And Franco tells Bobby Valentine, even as a starter, I can hit. And he's aboard with the second New York hit of the ball game. Yeah, the regular third baseman, Edgardo Alfonso, who uh, we saw back in spring training, had a terrific series against the Red Sox out in Las Vegas. He's on uh, on the bench with a bad hamstring. And Franco, who, as you mentioned, Sean, has been uh, really a terrific pinch hitter, picks up the base hit here in his first at bat. The Mets have also used Butch Husky at third. Lately, he's been a right fielder, not in the lineup tonight with Ochoa getting the start at right. Mets lead one to nothing, home half of the second. Franco at first and one out. Here is Alex Ochoa, the number seven hitter. He chopped one foul into the Boston dugout where Jeff Fry made the play. Now here's a time in the National League when you play National League baseball, you may see some action because you're getting down close to the hitter spot, the number nine hole, and they want to get some uh, guys in scoring position for the number eight hitter. Red Sox thinking along those lines through the first to keep an eye on Franco as one stolen base without being caught. Line to left just out of the reach of Garcia Parra. Back to back singles Franco to second Ochoa boarded first the throw to third got by Nearing Supon had to back it up in the coach's box. So the Mets have two men on with one out and they lead one to nothing in the second. Well it sounded like a broken bat line drive here by Ochoa is right down near the label of the bat. But he's able to muscle the ball just over the glove of uh, Nomar Garcia Parra and the Mets uh, again with men on first and second. They're swinging a Supon like they are very familiar with uh, Jeff and the Red Sox. Very anxious against Rick Reed. Choa probably hit against Supon in the International League. Luis Lopez might have as well. He was just called up from Norfolk, their AAA team in the International League, on June 2nd, the starting shortstop, making his second start at short since being called up a couple of weeks ago. Lopez. Has been up eight times with one hit a single. He's a switch hitter. One for seven for the Mets left handed 0 for one right handed. No homers or runs batted in. Been a very busy year so far for Lopez. He started the season uh, with San Diego. He was traded to Houston uh, on March 16th and then traded on May 31st to the Mets. To Tim Bogar. Out of the air in shallow center for Shane Mack. That's the second out of the inning. Runner still at first and second. Mets one, Red Sox nothing on a home run on the first pitch of the night thrown by Supon by Carl Everett. So now the pitcher, Rick Reed. He's not an automatic out. Been up 24 times with four hits. Three of the four hits doubles. Ratterberg crossed up by the pitch. He stabs at the ball and goes immediately to chat with Supon. Say, what was that all about? Not always the pitcher that makes the mistake. Sometimes the catcher forgets what he put down, and you can see clearly here that Hatterberg expecting the breaking ball and instead got the fastball. I think Hatterberg was fairly certain it was Supon's fault with his body language. Yeah. They snapped at the ball and then went out and hollered at Supon. The one over the pitcher, Reed. He tried to bunt and missed it. 
That's another thing Mary's going to have to be concerned about at third base. Uh, regardless of the outs, pitchers will uh, try to bunt at any time. And if they catch Nering behind the bag, they'll try to drop it down to keep the inning alive and let the leadoff man come to the plate. Breaking ball missed. Mets have one run on three hits. The Red Sox no runs, no hits. Most of the time when you see the pitcher hit, you'll see the outfield defense run way over toward right field if it's a right-handed hitter and very shallow. Like a pretty good pitch. Trupon staring at Ed Rapuano. There was some conversation when interleague play was put together about using split crews, mixing the American and National League umpires. They decided to go this way National League umpires in the National League card. Reed chased ball four and popped it right behind home plate. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, leave the National League guys here at their their ballpark and go back to Fenway, the American League. Use the American League umpires instead of mixing up the crews. They seem to work better together than when they're jumbled up. Really, you have any evidence to support that theory? <laughs> <laughs> Not from. <laughs> he struck him out with a high fastball, and that ends the inning. After two. One nothing New York on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Shea League leaders brought to you by Mazda. Experienced cars and trucks built with a passion for the road. Mazda. And this interleague play matchup features one of the top hitting teams in the American League, the Red Sox, at 288, second behind Seattle's 290. It's one of the best pitching staffs in the National League. The Mets are surprised in that regard. It, 3.45 behind only Atlanta and Los Angeles. They're doing it with some of their top young pitching prospects, Wilson, Isringhausen, Halsey, are all out due to injury. League leaders brought to you by Mazda. Well, we showed you the conversation at the mound between Hatterberg and Supon after the cross up, and that continued in the dugout between innings. This is on tape moments ago. Supon going over to try to make friends again with his catcher. The catchers get a little tired of getting crossed up. And again, the Hatterbrook was going over the signs with Supon one more time to make sure that he has it right. Now they're friends again, and he can go sit the other end of the dugout. And <laughs> everything's going to be okay. We well, can't blame Hatterbrook for being upset. It's a good way to get hurt. Troy O'Leary, the batter. He takes a strike. 288 Troy's average five homers at 18 runs batted in. Red Sox haven't managed anything in two innings against Rick Reed. He's not a hard thrower sinker slider type pitcher but he throws strikes and works quickly. Some of his recent outings haven't been as good as his early season average leading some of the Mets followers to think maybe he was starting to come back to earth a bit. It hasn't exactly been a dazzling career for uh, Rick Reed in his uh, time in the major leagues. Goes back a long time. I mentioned some time with Kansas City. He's also pitched for Pittsburgh, Texas, and Cincinnati in the majors. That's to right, and Alex Ochoa there to make the catch. Line drive out by O'Leary for the first out of the third. The Mets lead one to nothing. That's seven in a row. Retired to start the ball game by Reed. Shane Mack in the starting lineup again tonight, batting 279 with one run batted in. Shane's been up 43 times. He has 12 hits. And he takes a fastball for strike one. Shane's making his third straight start in center field. And his 14th start of the season in all. He's been the forgotten man for a while, but. He's getting a chance to play now. He broke his bat and dribbled it down to third. Frank goes throw just in time to get Mack. Shane hustled all the way. 
And was out by a running step. Two down to the Boston third. Well, for a while it looked like Franco was going to take one too many steps to it for his base and uh, Mack would be able to beat it out. Franco really not known for his defensive ability, uh, more of a offensive player, but uh, does record the out at first base. But one extra step. By the time he gets rid of it, it's going to be a close play. Now Jeff Supon, Red Sox pitchers have been working on the side. Uh, they're hitting, mostly in punting. They're hoping that when they get up there, they're men on base and they can bunt. First major league at bat for Supon. Get a shot of how shallow uh, the center field of Kyle <laughs> Everett is. They get to have a conversation with Jeff while he's up there at the plate. I remember a player named Dwayne Murphy who used to play for the Oakland A's, the center fielder. He played about that shallow for everybody. And that's frustrating for a hitter. You look up and say, there's no chance of dropping a base hitter. Well, Jeff made good contact there and fouled it off to the right. Well, <laughs> he looked like he was suppressing a smile. Happy that he just got good wood on a foul ball. Most of these guys really haven't hit since high school. Fastball missed. He's worked the count full. I like that double touch of home plate. Looks like he knows what he's doing. And he lines one to right, but it's right at Ochoa. He certainly didn't embarrass himself in that at bat. And Reed's pitched three perfect innings to start the ball game. Heading to the bottom of the third at Shea Stadium. 1 0 New York on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. New York. Mets have a 1 0 lead over the Red Sox. Bottom of the third inning. Come to friendly Fenway. The Sox host Bobby Benier, the National League Florida Marlins, on Monday, June 30th. The first 15,000 fans, 15 and under, receive a Red Sox waste pack compliments of McDonald's. For tickets, call 617 267. 1700. Carl, Carl Everett ready to lead off. Here's the first pitch of the night thrown by Supon back in the first, and Everett hammered it right at the home run apple. That gave the Mets a 1 0 lead, and it's still 1 0. Home run for Everett at sixth of the year. Five of the six while well, batting left handed. He's a switch here. Goes up there swing at the first one again. He sliced that foul and out of play to the left. Second time in a row he's got the fastball too on the first pitch. He's not a very good off speed pitch hitter. Uh, not very patient. He's only walked nine times, struck out 37. Change up, you can see how far out in the front foot he was taking that one. A dead fastball hitter, according to the uh, Red Sox scouting reports. And he takes the ball, low and away, one and two. Remember, it's hot, eight for his last 17 over the last six games, including the home run tonight. Lines that one to right. Darren Bragg catches it just below the belt. Looks like Darren is having a tough time judging that as it approached him, but he made the play for the first out. Yeah. Like a sinking line drive here uh, off the bat of Everett. Little top spin on it, and right at the last minute, you see Bragg have to really come in hard to make this play. Pitch is about knee high. Actually, the Red Sox coaching staff very familiar with the, the National League. Jimmy Williams, of course. Uh, Joe Kerrigan, Wendell Kim, the third base coach. All have spent time in the National League. Bernard Gilkey, the batter, and he looked at a strike. Gilkey walked on four pitches in the first, right after the home run by Everett, and then Supon settled down. Jim Williams told us yesterday he might have to. Explain to his players today the concept of the double switch that's popular in National League parks where you move a pitcher and a position player at the same time so that the pitcher can bat in a different spot in the batting order. Won't come up quickly in the next inning. So they didn't want any of position players to be offended when <laughs> they get the hook in the middle of an inning. Wonder what's this? So 
Swing and a miss. Gilkey down on strikes. That is the third strikeout of the night for Jeff Supon. Good curveball this time uh, from Supon to pick up the strikeout. A little bit sharper now as we get into the third inning than in the first two. The whole concept of a National League Baseball is to stay away from the pitcher. Let's keep him away from the plate as much mm -hmm. as possible. And of course, that's the reason. Remember the double switches that get him in part of a lineup where he doesn't have to hit for a couple of innings. John Olrud lined into a double play in the first. He had a line drive to the second baseman, Valentin, through the first to double up Gilkey. When we were chatting with Jimmy Williams yesterday, said when he was in the American League managing the Blue Jays, coaching for Toronto, he liked the DH and the National League. He liked the way they do it. He really feels that this concept's going to continue. They need to settle on one set of rules. Decide once and for all it'll be the DH or going to be the pitchers. But you can't have both. In the opinion of Jimmy Williams. Nice play by Mobon. He threw to first to Supon covering to get Olderud. And in the inning. After three, this is the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Sixty-eight Sports welcomes you back to Shea Stadium where the Mets lead one to nothing. Where the Mets management ought to be embarrassed by the performance they put on here tonight. Starting a half an hour before the game. Highlights of the 86 World Series. They have Mookie Wilson throughout the first ball, and now on every break between innings. They're showing more highlights of the 86 World Series. And as we speak, they're showing Ray Knight dancing on home plate. You can see it out there in left center field. The ball going through Buckner's legs. That's the second time we've seen that already. Mr. Mets haven't had a lot to be proud of since then, so. It's not like it's the same players that are in here playing against each other either. No. Omar Garcia part of the batter you saw the impressive numbers for Rick Reed 26 pitches only six balls. He's thrown three perfect innings. Nomar led off the ball game by bouncing out of the first pitch of Red Sox center league play to third. It's this one to short Luis Lopez throws him out. Ten up and ten down for Boston. They show the whole highlight film of that season uh, for the Mets that was uh, during. As the crowd was starting to come in here, they showed it from the beginning to end, uh, right to the ugly moment right at the end. And now every inning they're showing these clips. I mean, it's getting, you know. It's ridiculous. It, is ridiculous. it really is. It really it's is. classless. And that's, I not, think. that's not saying from, you know, because you're, you work for the Red Sox. Or, no. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Sure it is. Darren Bragg is the batter. Who are they trying to upset? Uh, Jim Rice? I guess that's. Who it is because the last of the uh, Red Sox from that team, Roger Clemens and Mike Greenwell, no longer here. They don't have anybody in uniform who is playing for the Red Sox who played on that team. Bragg chops one foul. Reed continues to throw virtually nothing but strikes. 0 and 2 on Darren Bragg. It's really just blatantly obnoxious what they're doing. You're, you're going to understand the occasional <laughs> highlight or something, but every inning. Yeah, you expected to see it tonight, it's but not almost over childish. Over. It is childish, obnoxious. Pick your own word. High chopper down to third. Franco gets bragged by a step. Two down to the fourth. Three and two thirds. Perfect innings for Rick Reed. Well, one thing we've uh, seen from the left side of the infield and again it's not their regular left side but the, both Franco and Lopez the shortstop have very strong throwing arms. One nothing New York in the fourth here's Mo grounded to the second baseman. In the first inning. Bayerga threw him out. Oh, it's very hot coming into this series. He's hit in four of his last five, nine for his last 16 coming in. Now nine for 17 with the 0 for 1 tonight. The three home runs in the last five games. He chops out the first. Old Rude to Reed. That's four perfect innings pitched by Rick Reed. The Mets lead one to nothing. We'll be right back after these words from your local stations. This is the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. 
now. It's on the big screen out there in left center field. We'll give you tonight's game summary brought to you by MCI. This is a great time or what? Great time for the Mets. First inning, first pitch thrown by Jeff Supon. Carl Everett hit it out of the ballpark to center field. That's got two men on in the second, but could not score. Rick Reed has retired every Red Sox batter in just 33 pitches through four innings. And Jeff Supon, the first Red Sox pitcher to bat since Roger Clemens. His memorable base hit off Norm Charlton of Seattle. Supon coming off his first one, two, three innings. He's retired five in a row. Pitching to Todd Hundley, ball one to the dirt, a breaking ball. A run on three hits for the Mets, no runs, no hits for the Red Sox. Neither team has made an error. Sounded like it was going to Cincinnati. It did? Yeah. Someplace far away. <laughs> well, we're in game seven now, so that's good news. It's almost over, but I'm yeah. sure they're going to start it all over again once they get yeah. to game seven. Highlight shown between the innings of the 86 series. It's the seventh game. Hundley with a long drive to right center, and that ball's gone. Second home run given up by Supon. Todd Hundley's 15th home run of the year. That leads the Mets, and the Mets lead the Red Sox two to nothing. Well, Hundley now only four behind Jeff Bagwell, who leads the league in home runs with 19. Supon now, in his fifth start, has given up five home runs. That's on the changeup. The one to Everett in the first inning was the fastball. Hundley doing a nice job staying back on the changeup and picking up number 15. Only he's become one of the best players in the National League. Carlos Bayerga, the batter. Supon tied him up. Bayerga popped it up. Right at Nomar. One out. Here's Doug Brown. All right, Sean. Thanks very much. Full schedule of interleague play today and tonight. We're going to check out the vet in Philadelphia. The, and the Phillies. Kurt Schilling on the mound for Philadelphia. Hey, that's a double into the gap by Ed Sprague. That'll score Orlando Merced with the first run of the game in the fourth. one nothing Blue Jays. Back to Sean and Jerry. Thank you, Doug. Those Philadelphia Phillies will be at Fenway for the first interleague game at Fenway beginning Monday. We'll have that ball game for you Monday night from Fenway Park. Supon missed down and in to Matt Franco, who singled to right in the second. I'll be anxious to see some of the attendance numbers uh, around uh, baseball from today's action. Right down the line, right at Mohan. He'll make the play himself. Well, as we discussed last night, John Harrigan tells us that at the meetings that he attended the last couple of days with Red Sox Vice President John Buckley, the word around baseball is that attendance would be ahead about 40% over what these dates would have drawn had there just been regular games within the leagues. But in some places it's a lot higher boost than that when you talk about the Cubs and the White Sox when they play and the Yankees and the Mets interleague play is a tremendous success obviously in other matchups it won't be test of interleague play will be two or three years down the road will they continue to draw when some of these matchups might change they might play other divisions. And well, the novelty wear off and fans won't be as captivated by it. Well, I know this is only the uh, first one, obviously, that we've uh, done, but it feels like an exhibition game. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the feeling of a regular season no, game. No, it does not. But it counts. Ochoa, the left center, a gapper. Mack racing to cut it off. He was able to stop it right in front of the warning track, but Alex Ochoa has a double. And he is two for two, a single and a double. He's in scoring position with two outs in the New York fourth. Well, maybe Ochoa needed some American League pitching to get him going. He was only hitting 203 coming into the game tonight, but uh, two for two, the single and this double. He'll find that gap in uh, left center field by the time Shane Mack's able to backhand the ball and knock it down. Sure, in scoring position. And now we'll see an intentional walk uh, with the pitcher due up next. Number eight hitter gets a lot of walks in the National League. Luis Lopez will be intentionally passed, and they'll pitch to Rick Reed, who struck out swinging in the second. 
And that's the two to nothing on a pair of solo homers. Carl Everett led off the first with a home run, and Todd Hundley began the fourth with a homer. First National League move that Jimmy Williams has had to make tonight. Intentionally walking the number eight hitter in the lineup. He's certainly used to all this type of maneuvering. And he spent several seasons as Bobby Cox was third base coach for the Atlanta Braves. So here comes Reed with two outs and two men on. He batted with two men on, same situation. First and second and two outs in the second, and he whiffed a 3 2 pitch. He went down swinging. In the outfield, very shallow for the Red Sox, and swung way around toward right. Started him with an off-speed pitch, a breaking ball for a strike. Jimmy Williams is saying National League pitching will always take batting practice when the team is at home, and usually on the road. Sometimes it's just the starting pitcher that will uh, take batting practice. Chopper to the right side. Valentin had to go to the outfield grass to make the play. And the Mets strand two. They had a run on the Hundley Homer. After four, two nothing New York on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Forward and left center field, Ray Knight is crossing the plate and getting mobbed in the Mets dugout. It's a highlight of 1986. First one of those we've seen tonight. Friends, we remind you about Speedy's summer with the Sox sweepstakes. Now it's your chance to see the Sox spring training 98 in Fort Myers win prime seats in the 68 Sports Fenway Skybox or a pair of tickets to a Red Sox home game. Enter to win at any Boston area Speedy location. The summer with the Sox sweepstakes brought to you by Speedy Auto Service, the Boston Globe, and 68 Sports. Red Sox still looking for their first base runner as they come up in the fifth inning. Rick Reed has pitched four perfect innings on just 33 pitches. Red Sox have only hit three balls to the outfield. Fly balls for outs by Valentin O'Leary and Jeff Supon. It'll be the middle third of the order here in the fifth. Tim Nairing, Scott Hatterberg. And John Valentin. Nearing popped up the second baseman Carlos Bayerga in shallow right in the second. First pitch a ball outside. TWA to St. Louis. They're amazing how you can tell where those planes are going from this far away. Now that's their big hub, so that was an easy one there. Mm -hmm. Flight 2050. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking ball, chopped to short. And Luis Lopez to John O'Rourke for the out. But what do you think of the idea of interleague play? Think it's a good idea? You like it? I have been against it right from the beginning. You and me both. Yeah, I. Uh, I would prefer to see it stay in the All-Star Game and the World Series. I just don't like the idea of coming in and seeing a team three times the way it is right now. It's great for the fans, and that's why they have it. And obviously tonight they've got a good crowd here, and that's what it's supposed to be for for the fans. As a player, I would not like it. Mm -hmm. Scott Hatterberg to batter. He chops one foul. I just think one of the things that's always been special about baseball, it's like the World Series. Matches two teams that haven't played each other the entire year. There's the separation of leagues. I think now, from a historical perspective, some of the records are tainted. The records so much a part of baseball. Campbell of Hatterberg set some sort of a single game record tonight. That would only be an American League record. Chops one up the middle of base hit. The Red Sox have their first base runner. Uh, Rick Reed had pitched perfect baseball for four and a third, and the fans applaud his efforts. 
As the Red Sox get their first base runner on a bounding ball single through the middle by Scott Hatterberg. Like a change up that Hatterberg had to go down and away and kind of punch up the middle for the base hit. Hatterberg this season has been a much better hitter in his road games. I should say at Fenway than in the road. Getting only about 200 uh, on the road this year but uh, picks up the first Red Sox base hit. Well, he's always been a good Shea Stadium hitter. He has been. That's exactly right. Yeah. One for, for batting 500 in this part. John Valentin the batter. Swing and a miss at a breaking ball. John fly to the left in the second. Mets lead 2 nothing. Top of the fifth. They are out hitting the Red Sox 5 to 1. I would personally like to see him get the, the realignment all squared away and then have a bundle of games against the Yankees, the Blue Jays, the Baltimore Orioles, and whoever else is in our division. An unbalanced schedule. Exactly. Maybe go out west one time mm -hmm. and that's it. Well, they're trying to get to that even with interleague play factored in. There's a movement among the major league owners to shorten the season perhaps down to about 154 games start a week earlier to avoid some of the weather problems we saw this year go to an unbalanced schedule where you play the teams in your division more often perhaps 18 times during the season and still play 15 interleague games each year you really wouldn't see a lot of the teams from the other divisions within your own league. Well, they certainly need realignment. You can't put Tampa Bay in the West. No. Which is where they're slated to go right now. They belong in the East and uh, probably Detroit would have to move uh, to the Central Division. I'm going to say today had what they claimed was the proposal to put together by John Harrington's realignment committee in the paper today. That proposal had Arizona moving into the American League. They Right now, slated to go to the National League. Apparently, Jerry Colangelo, who runs that franchise, is not happy about that because he says their fan surveys out there say about 64% of their fans want to be in the National League. Ball inside, full count on Valentin. We'll see if Hatterberg runs with one out. lead two to nothing tying run of the plate for Boston in the fifth Atterberg is running Valentin chops one foul past third it's kind of strange here tonight too because of the rain there was no batting practice for either ball club so the first time you saw these two teams appear is just before game time play a little catch and they get ready to go so some of the excitement on the field that uh, might have happened you know during batting practice uh, all the interviews and stuff like that uh, not happening tonight quiet atmosphere to uh, game time a late arriving crowd but it's a big crowd here now as you can see they expected about 40,000 they expect more than 30,000 for an afternoon game here tomorrow as you mentioned those types of crowds well above average for the Mets who are averaging under 19,000 per home date. Seems to me and it's not to pick on this ballpark but uh, they could use more lighting out in the, especially left center field. It kind of looks like a minor league park out there. Awful dark. And the whole light stand only about uh, what the half of it is lit up. Yeah at most out there in left center field they have. Uh, 12 light bulbs illuminated. And there's a deep drive down the left field line. That ball is hooking toward the pole. It's a tie ball game. A two run homer by John Ballington. And the Red Sox are on the board in interleague play. It's two to two. Home run number five of the season. Runs batted in 26 and 27. For John Valentin, who grew up not far from here over in Jersey City. Yeah, actually, during the introductions of both teams, Valentin and Vaughn have the biggest ovations for Red Sox players. Swing and a miss there by Valentin. Fouled off by Valentin. 
Eventually running the count to three and two. A couple of foul balls. And finally gets one up about the belt high. And will lose it down that left field line. Number five on the season for Valentin. His last one against Cleveland. He did a tremendous job remembering that sequence of pitches, Jerry. Photographic memory, Sean. You do. Well, this is the night of entirely Little League play games. Right now, five American League teams are leading. One American League team has already won. One AL team is losing, and there are two ties, so. The American League is kicking butt and taking names right now. A big night last night, too, right? Oh, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Send the word early. I think all those games last night, though, in the American League Park. Doesn't matter. The junior circuit will handle them no matter where it is. Well, maybe they'll want to quit after this year. I think so. They may want to call it off right now. They can take their real baseball and their pitches hitting and play their <laughs> own game. <laughs> Mariners beat the Rockies last night. There's a deep drive by O'Leary to right. That ball is gone. And Rick Reed, who was perfect for four in the third innings, has now given up three straight hits, the last two home runs. And the Red Sox have the lead, three to two. Now, this is something you might see in interleague play the second time through the lineup. The hitters not familiar with the opposing pitcher, but they get a better look the second time around. Like a changeup. O'Leary reaching out with almost one hand. Ball seems to be carrying very well here tonight at uh, Shea Stadium. Rita not giving up a hit till the fifth inning, and he's given up three in a row and two of those home runs. Well, very quickly, the Red Sox take the three to two lead. On O'Leary's sixth of the year, he's knocked in 19. For a total tonight of $200,000. Raised from prostate cancer research. See Jeff Fry kind of uh, getting O'Leary about the sign. That's uh, getting back at Everett, who back in the first inning uh, had some kind of dance he was doing after he hit his home run. And Everett's not exactly a guy that hits 40 or 50 a year. No, so, so you know, he has had time to practice the dance. Shane Mack, the batter. First ball swing, he fouls one out of play to the right. Well, last night in the interleague play games, the Angels beat San Diego. Oakland beat Los Angeles. Seattle beat Colorado. The only American League team to lose was Texas in the first game. San Francisco. A little looper to right, handled by Ochoa, two down. Another thing you'll see is. PA announcers in the ballpark might not know the pronunciations of the other team's names. Jeff Supan is just introduced by the PA man here. I know one guy that won't make any mistakes, and that's the gentleman over at the Yankee Stadium, Bob, Bob Shepard. Shepard. And at Fenway Park, Ed Brickley, who right. has done a terrific job in his first year as public address announcer. It's not that hard to go down the hall and ask somebody if Philly would get a team for the correct pronunciations of the name. But here at Shea Stadium, they're too busy rewinding the tapes of 1986 to actually try to get their current state of affairs in order. <laughs> Sue Pan swings and misses for strike three. But a big inning for the Red Sox. They get three runs, a couple of homers by Valentin and O'Leary. Halfway through the ball game. Three to two Red Sox on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Three two lead on the home runs by Valentin and O'Leary. Well, it's American League against the National League when the Phillies visit friendly Fenway June 16th through the 18th. They're Don't going down them. hard. <laughs> Don't miss the first Little League matchup of the season at Fenway. Plenty of seats are available. The tickets call 617-267-1700. Well, Chair, I'll give you one guess what they played on that big screen out there in left center field between innings. Yeah, there it is. Jesse Orozco. I think it's even boring the fans here now at yeah. Jay Stadium. 
be interesting to see if the Red Sox players have anything to say about this. As we mentioned, none of them were on that team, but you know, they're in the Red Sox organization. They are aware of the history, and uh, this has gone way beyond the bounds of bad taste. I bet you there are some guys on this team right now that even know who played in the 86 World Series. You're probably right. They know now. Yeah, it would be hard to uh, miss it. Top of the order for the Mets. Jeff Supon pitching with the lead for the first time. Three to two after the three run uprising by the Red Sox in the top of the fifth. Carl Everett homered and did a dance in the first. On the first pitch of the night thrown by Supon. Last time up he lined to right. Bernard Gilkey on deck than John Older. 2 and 0 the count. We mentioned earlier, and I wanted to amplify the point. Ed Brick, the new PA announcer at Fenway, has just done a terrific job. And you know what? We particularly appreciate. He is flawless on the balls and strikes on that scoreboard out there in left field, which he operates. I don't know if the fans realize that. Down to first, nice play by the glove dog going to his left toward the line to make the play. The public address announcer at Fenway operates that. Those green lights and red lights that light up in the scoreboard in the left field wall, and Ed Brickley is flawless. Just as Mo Vaughn was on that play, has the hustle to get to the bag to beat Everett. The other thing about Ed Brickley, he's a very nice man. Too. Oh, he is a terrific guy. And I have to give the boo of the week to Bob Ryan, who uh, took a little shot at Ed for some announcement he made about fans welcome this day for the second game of the doubleheader the other night. First of all, Bob should have been around long enough to know that. Uh, Oftentimes the organization gives you the material you're supposed to read and you read it. It wasn't necessarily Ed's announcement, which is the way it was phrased in the column, Brickley's announcement. And obviously it was a very slow week for columns if that was the best he could do on that particular night. Bernard Guilty has walked and struck out. Red Sox lead three to two. Fifth inning. Guilty up the middle. And the Mets have the time run at first. Base hit out of the reach of Nomar as he ranged to his left. So Guilty's on for the second time. And the Mets have their sixth hit. We'll pause for station identification along the 68 Sports Red Sox television network. John Olerud, the batter. He is lined out and grounded out. In the dirt, good backhand pickup by Hatterberg to keep that tying run at first base. Scott Hatterberg getting a lot more playing time than he probably expected to get to coming out of spring training. And the more he plays, the better he seems to get it, particularly that, stopping the ball from getting to the backstop. Still had some problems, though, throwing out runners. Yogi with three steals, but he's been thrown out five times. And he's back to first. And just to be fair, the point Bob Ryan was trying to make the other night, I think, was that it was arrogant somehow of the Red Sox. Announced during the first game that fans are welcome to stay for the second game. Well, I understood the point of the announcement as somebody was sitting in the stands that night. This day and age, but there's a deep drive foul on the right. This day and age, with so many split double headers and separate admission double headers, there might have been some people in the ballpark who didn't know if their ticket for that particular game entitled them to stay for the second one. So. I just thought it was weak all the way around, particularly the part that pertained to Ed Brickley, like it was his fault when all he's doing is reading something that's handed to him. John Wasden warming up in the bullpen.
Good move to first that time. Gilkey's back safely. Red Sox lead three to two, fifth inning. Gilkey at first and one out. Well, he just turned it around. He felt the Toronto people sort of got him out of his natural swing, trying to get him to hit for more power, hit more home runs, drive in more runs. He's always been a guy who went with the pitch, took it to left field if that's what the pitch dictated. The best part of the deal is that Toronto's playing a lot of his salary, right? Mm-hmm. He's up around five million a year, if I'm not mistaken. A pop up left side of the infield. That'll be the second out of the inning as Nearing makes the catch. So Olerud's 0 for 3. And there are two down in the fifth inning. Nice job there by Supon after a uh, changeup that was away. Nice follow up pitch, a fastball inside. And that's how you like to pitch Olerud with the fastball. Try to jam him. Likes to get his arms extended, likes to go to the opposite field. Here they'll go right in tight on the hands. You see, he tries to bring him in, but uh, can't get it in far enough. Watch out for this guy. Yep. Hunley took Supon out of here in his last at bat. Give the Mets a 2 0 lead at the time, but the Red Sox scored three times in the top of this inning. Lead 3 to 2. Hunley could put the Mets back up with one swing. Todd struck out swinging. Back in the first. Hundley's the son of former Major League catcher Randy Hundley. He played with the Giants, the Cubs, the Twins, the Padres. And like Todd, wore the uniform number nine. He credits a lot of his success power-wise to lifting weights. He's not a very big guy when he first got to the big leagues and really has pumped a ton of iron and become much stronger. And the home runs have followed. That goes against the uh, old baseball traditions of not lifting weights, but uh, it's a different game now. Yeah, if you do it the right way, right. it can be helpful, as in the case of Hunley. With 41 homers last year, he had not hit more than 16 in the season. And all of a sudden, he hit 41. Had a bird. Not pleased that he was rattled by that foul ball. Hatterberg usually a very quiet guy but he's got a kind of a New York attitude tonight. <laughs> he was upset with Supon when he was crossed up early in the ball game and uh, not happy yeah, with the foul tip. And Hunley being a fellow catcher can sympathize and he's taking plenty of time outside the batter box to allow Hatterberg to shake it off. Hunley's 41 homers last year set the major league record for home runs in a season by a catcher. But it lasted 43 years. Ray Campanella hit 40 for Brooklyn in 53. Popped up in foul ground. Mo has room. Halfway between home and first in foul territory. He ends the inning. After five, three to two Boston. This is the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Sixty eight sports welcomes you back to Shea Stadium in New York on the Dunkin Donuts scoreboard the Red Sox lead the Mets three to two after five Red Sox were hitless through four innings they did not have a base runner through four and a third but then they got three straight hits last inning a single by Scott Hatterberg a two run homer by John Valentin followed by a solo homer by Troy O'Leary. And it's three to two as we head to the sixth. Leading off shortstop no more one of the pleasant aspects of Tonight's ball game here at Shea Stadium, a visit from Massachusetts native Ed Coleman, who was a radio personality in Boston on WBZ for a while, and is now here on WFA in New York, one of the real good guys in sports broadcasting. Covers the Mets now, but someday he'll get back to a job that's fun. Base hit in the left field for Nomar Garcia Para. He's one for three, the lead man on for Boston. 
And here's another one of the good guys of sports broadcasting, Doug Brown. Oh, thanks so much, Sean. That's a Bud Light scoreboard update right now, checking the inner league play. And there are lots of games to tell you about. The Brewers got a win earlier. The Yankees and Marlins, great pitchers duel. Likewise, the White Sox and Reds. Expos lead the Tigers. Blue Jays have that 2-0 lead over the Phillies. Royals and Pirates tied. Orioles lead the Braves in the sixth. Twins over the Astros in the third. Back to Sean and Jerry. Now the Orioles Braves matchup at Turner Field, much ballyhooed with the pitching matchups. The front three starters for each staff working in that series. Darren Bragg, the batter. With nobody out, Garcia Pyro runs. It's bounced down to first. Olderu took a look at second, decided to take the sure thing at first. So Nomar is in scoring position with one out. The movement kept the Red Sox out of a double play. Jimmy Williams not really fond of the sacrifice. Uh, Red Sox don't use it very much at all. They're next to the bottom of the league in that category. He prefers uh, to go with the hit and run. And the same uh, job there. They get the man in a scoring position. You know, if you have the hitters, you can get the bat and the ball. Why not try that? Where at least you might have a chance of getting a hit rather than just basically giving up the out with a sacrifice. The only team that has sacrificed less than the Red Sox are the uh, Texas Rangers. And the Mets will intentionally walk Mo Vaughn. And that will be the first walk given up by Reed. They'll pitch the right handed hitting Nearing with first and second and one out in the sixth, and with Boston leading three to two. Bobby Valentine, the Mets manager, longtime manager of the Texas Rangers. I was told today that when Valentine got this job, it was not a very popular move uh, with the uh, Mets fans. Bobby spending uh, some time in Japan managing across the Texas Rangers. They say he's quieted down quite a bit. Sometimes misunderstood, I think, by a lot of people. Yeah, he rubs some folks the wrong way when he's in Texas. He comes across as a a little full of himself, I would say, is an accurate way of putting it. I'm not sure that's fair, as you say. I think he's a, the more you talk to him, the more you think he's a better guy. He's a very enthusiastic guy. He loves baseball, uh, very similar to Tommy Lasorda. He's a pretty good ambassador for the game of baseball. Mm -hmm. And I've known him for a long time. I, I kind of like the guy, but. Yes, I do too. He has had some run ins uh, with different people. And it's Texas from 85 through 92. Tim Nearing. Took a strike. Bobby Valentine was uh, like that when he played. Very enthusiastic. Loved to be on the field. And he'd have had a heck of a career for himself had he not uh, had that terrible leg injury. He was considered one of the top prospects in all of baseball when he first came into the majors. Nearing a broken bat flare. That's a fair ball. Just inside the right field line. Around to score Garcia Parra on the third ball. It's a broken bat double for Nearing. And the move for Bobby Valentine didn't pay off. Wasn't exactly a cannon blast from Nearing, but he'll take it. And the Red Sox lead by two. I think Nearing was intentionally trying to go to the right side because he saw Baega get over to second base for a pickoff. You see the inside out swing, but uh, the ball goes by Olerud at first base instead. And uh, just inside the foul line for the double. Not exactly crushed, but I really think Nearing was trying to go mm -hmm. in that direction. Because Baega was standing at second base expecting a pickoff. And Kim waving around Garcia Parra. And the Red Sox now with a two run lead. And there you have three runs batted in last night, has one tonight. He is 35 for the year. Scott Hatterberg took ball one. And that's trying some trickery there. They had the infield back, and then when the pitcher were through the home plate, they came charging in. That's trying to fool the third base coach, and obviously the runner at third. Vaughn, the runner at third, nearing at second. Hit here would be large for Hatterberg. Scott had the first Red Sox hit. He was their first base runner last inning. He bounced a single up the middle. After Reed started the night, pitching perfect ball for four and a third inning. Scott scored on the balance on Homer. Jimmy Williams was talking about how the uh, word was around the National League for many years that the Mets in spring training used to work on a play designed for day games here at Shea when the planes were always coming right overhead and the other team had a runner on second they'd sort of hold the ball on the mound until the plane came over and then they try to sneak in behind the runner at second and pick him off feeling like he wouldn't be able to hear the hollering from the coach 
<laughs> Boy, that's home field advantage. Yeah, <laughs> they would actually, I guess, down in spring training, pipe in playing music and have everybody move on cue. When they reach a thousand feet, everybody moves. And if they're in cahoots with uh, the Guire over there to get the planes going at the, when they're on runners, yeah, a second hey, let's pick up the uh, departure traffic over there in the tower. Hatterberg up the middle, most started down the line. Now he's trying to get back to third and can out. Lopez threw him out. Most started down the line, and then when he went to jam the brakes on, he slipped. And Lopez gets him going back to third for the second out of the inning. So now it's first and second with two down. Terrible base running here by Vaughn. He, uh, you see the shortstop is in, and Vaughn knew that. So you know that a ground ball on that side, he's not going to be going on contact. Starts down the line, and then uh, Lopez will uh, throw him out at third base. And it wasn't one of the tricks that worked. They had Baega back that time, but they had the shortstop in right from the beginning. So obviously Kim saw that, told Vaughn, and he was not to go on a ground ball. But Mo apparently did not listen. John Valentin, the batter, he tied up the ball game with a two-run homer last inning. He drives that one to deep left. Gilkey racing back. It's over his head and off the wall and a hop. Nearing around to score. Hatterberg is being waved in. Here comes the relay throw, and Hatterberg is out at home. Gilkey got it in quickly to the cutoff man. I believe it was Lopez, the shortstop, and his throw was in time to get Hatterberg. Well, the Red Sox get two in the inning. We'll be right back to these words from your local stations. This is the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Just thrown out on this play. And Valentin uh, right on everything tonight. A hard line drive over Gilkey. He said Gilkey has eight outfield assists, a very good arm, and very accurate there to the cutoff man. And Lopez also with a strong arm will get Hatterberg at home. That's the time to take chances, though, when there are two outs in the inning. Had Vaughn not been uh, picked off third base, had it definitely been two runs for the Red Sox. Instead, just the one and the nice relay play here by the Mets to get Hatterberg. Jeff Supon now pitching with a three run lead, the biggest advantage of the night for Boston. Valentin has driven in three of the five Red Sox runs. Carlos Baerga, the batter. One strike to count. He's 0 for 2. And now up there with a count of 0 and 2. Baerga is grounded out and popped to short. He came over from Cleveland last year on July 29th with Alvaro Espinosa in exchange for infielders Jeff Kent and Jose Vizcaino, both of whom were subsequently moved along by the Indians. Baerga might be hurt. Bobby Valentine out with the trainer. That's exactly what Valentine does not need. Another infield or a hurt for his ball club. Going to get two short stops out of action. Third baseman and now by Eger seems to be OK as he gets back within the box. He played in only 26 games for the Mets after that trade on July 29th last year because he had an abdominal strain. The 0 2 to Carlos Baerga on the ground. Base hit. An 0 2 hit. Surrendered by Supan. It's almost as painful for a pitcher as a base on ball as you get ahead of a hitter 0 and 2 and you make a mistake on the 0 2 pitch. Way too good a pitch here. Uh, sailing back in over the heart of the plate, and Baerga will jump on it for the base hit. Matt Franco is the batter. Red Sox lead five to two. The Mets have seven hits. The Red Sox six. Red Sox hits have come in bunches in the last two innings. Franco has one of the New York hits. A single to right in the second. He grounded out to the first baseman, Mo Vaughn, in the fourth. I think the next time we come to Shea Stadium for an interleague play game, which might be two years from now, I think the Mets are going to come to Fenway next year. All goes to form. Uh, I'm going to bring a miner's helmet so we can read our notes up here. And I know this is it's a little dark in this booth. 
This is a little bit dark. There is one light uh, that was probably put in here when the ballpark was built. How long ago? 30 years? Yes, back in the early 60s. And I think it's the same light bulb that was in there 30 mm -hmm. years ago. A little dim. John Wasden throwing in the bullpen. Frank over the base hit just out of the reach of Vaughn. Baerga will stop at second as Bragg got to it quickly and has a good arm. So with two quick base hits, the Mets will get the tying run to the plate. And Jimmy Williams is chatting about Supon's future with Joe Kerrigan. Or holding the man on and one crossover step in the dive cannot make the play. And uh, now we're going to have Jimmy Williams comes out and we're going to have a double switch. Uh, we'll probably see Valentin, I would think, leave the game. Fry would probably go to second and the pitcher would be put in the Valentin spot. He made the last out. Unless he's going to change catches. One of the two. Well, it could be an all new battery. The pitcher went into Hatterberg's spot. He'd be the eighth batter of the next inning. As I mentioned, Jimmy Williams explained to the players the concept of the double switch, so none of them would be offended when this happened. And apparently, he's going to replace the pitcher and somebody else because the pitcher would bat third in the seventh <laughs> inning. John Wasden in from the bullpen with the score the Red Sox five and the Mets two. This is the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. The Mets are threatening here in the bottom of the sixth. The third edition of the official Red Sox magazine is now available. Inside of stories on shortstop Nomar Garcia Paris, center fielder Darren Bragg, and a preview of the Sox interleague schedule. Receive your copy, send a check for 350 to Red Sox magazine for Yorkie Way, Boston Mass 02215 3496. All new battery for the Red Sox as. Jimmy Williams uses a double switch. Bill Hasselman is the catcher and John Waz in the pitcher. Supon out after five innings plus two batters here in the sixth. Boston of late a member of the bullpen has divided his time between striding and relieving. He's making his 20th appearance. His 13th in relief. Supon threw 79 pitches while he was out there. 46 of them strikes. He would be the winning pitcher. He cannot lose it. Alex Ochoa with two for two. Against Supon with a single and a double. First pitch by Wasden. Back straightening breaking ball for strike one. Ochoa single to left in the second. Double to left center in the fourth. Was stranded in each inning. The runner at second is Carlos Baerga at first. Matt Franco. Nobody out. 5 2 Boston in the sixth. Boston. Same pitch, same result. 0 and 2. Third, a double play ball if they hurry. Valentin turned it. 5 4 3, nearing Valentin and Vaughn. Valentin was upended but still made the play. And a big double play ground ball induced by John Wasden. Uh, Wasden, normally a fly ball pitcher, but here he stays with the curveball against a Cho and gets the ground ball. Three straight curveballs from Wasden. And a nice job by John Valentin hanging tough because uh, Franco was in very hard on him at second base. You see the good hard clean slide but uh, Valentin with strong arms able to complete the double play. Two big outs for John Wisden. Looked like that pitch might have crossed up Hassman had it not been hit. He was coming up out of his crouch. Though he was expecting a fastball. Runner at third two outs. Luis Lopez the batter. Pitchers on deck but at this point of the ball game if they walk Lopez they might well hit for the pitcher. Now 
this the guy you want to get because you're probably going to get a better hitter pinch hitting for Reed uh, than you have at the plate right now. Mm -hmm. And that better hitter would be the tying run of the plate. Now the play to the left. For those of you who aren't familiar with the concept of double switch, which is very common in the National League, here's what the Red Sox lineup looks like now. Wasden and Hasselman coming into the ball game at the same time. Wasden goes into the spot on the batting order previously occupied by Hatterberg. Hasselman takes Supon's spot on the batting order. Since Troy O'Leary is scheduled to lead off the next inning of the Red Sox, Wasden would be the eighth batter of the inning while Hasselman would hit third. That's why Jimmy Williams did what he did. Garcia Parra on the outfield grass makes the catch and a terrific job by Wasden. He came in with runners at first and second and nobody out. And he got Jimmy Williams and the Sox out of the inning unscathed. Heading to the seventh. Still five to two Red Sox on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Back at Shea Stadium in New York where the Red Sox fell behind tonight two to nothing but they've scored five unanswered runs and they lead by a count of five to two as we go to the seventh and there's a new pitcher on the mound for the New York Mets. Harry Manuel will be taking over for the Mets making his 18th appearance of the season a record of 0 and 1. All those appearances out of the bullpen 28 hits allowed in 21 and two thirds 10 walks 19 strikeouts. Manuel's picked up for the Montreal Expos back at the end of March for cash considerations. He appeared in 53 games a year ago and had 86 innings for the Expos. Thought you said Barry Manilow when he first came in. Barry Manilow. <laughs> <laughs> Rick Reed, the starter, went six innings, allowed five runs, all earned on six hits, including two home runs. He walked one, and it was an intentional walk. And Reed struck out two. He'll be the losing pitcher. It extended his string of having pitched at least six innings in every start this year with exactly six innings worth tonight. Great through a lot of strikes, 72 pitches, 52 of them strikes. Bottom third of the order, Troy O'Leary, Shane Mack, Bill Hasselman. O'Leary lined to right in the third, then Homer to right, right after the Valentin Homer in the fifth inning. Troy's Home run gave the Red Sox their first lead of the night. It added to that lead. Manuel's first pitch a strike. Chopped right at the second baseman by Erga. One out. Palace by Ega when he first came to the big leagues with the third baseman with the Cleveland Indians and uh, over at San Diego. That's with Jim Tomey in that organization. The move. Uh, was made to put by Ager at second base only an average defensive second baseman. Shane Mack the batter little looper shallow left center that falls for a hit. So Shane's one for three. One out base runner in the seventh for Boston that seven Red Sox hits tonight. Bill Hassman up for the first time tonight hitting 255 with three homers and 17 runs batted in. Mac still looking for his first Red Sox stolen base. He's 0 for 1. Hasselman will swing in a foul tip at home plate. Todd Hundley, the catch has thrown out about 29% of the runners that have gone uh, so far this, this year against him. Joe on the run. It's Everett on the edge of the warning track. 
before the second out of the inning. Ball hit a long way by Hasselman. Everett not far from the 396 mark. Made the catch. That had been a good ball for a Mac to get back to first base and tag up. You knew it was not going to be out of the ballpark, and you could tell the way that Everett was going after it. He was going to make the catch, and once he does make that catch, he's very deep. And sometimes you can tag and get yourself in a scoring position. Mm -hmm. It's worth the gamble, especially when you have the lead in the ball game. Everett was deep and was still drifting away from the infield. He would have had a tough time getting himself ready to make a strong throw to get Mac. Chains at first with two outs for Nomar Garcia Parra. Boston leads five to two in the seven. Nomar big swing and a pop up very high. It'll be close. Franco over to the rail. And he can't get it. It's in the Boston dugout. Really not that much room in uh, foul territory here at Shea Stadium. Franco right to the top step of the Red Sox dugout. And then gets a little help uh, after they realize that he cannot make the catch. Almost bounced back up and hit him in the head. One off speed pitch high. Mac back to first. And a bad time for Mac to try to go. Uh, two outs, try to get yourself in scoring position if you're thrown out. Got see if Parra leads off next inning. Up and away, two balls and a strike. That's the pitch you want, too, the breaking ball. Sometimes that runner at first base will take a peek in toward the catcher to see if he can pick up the sign. There's uh, certainly not any fancy about signs when there's just a the man on first base. And across with the right handed hitter at the plate, uh, it's quite easy to look in and see the sign. Occupied with Mac. That was the ideal time. The 2 1 count with two outs is very unlikely they would pitch out. And base runners in this count like to go. Ball three high. Three balls, one strike. Two outs. Mac at first. Seventh inning. Boston has a 5 to 2 lead. Red Sox will have Tim Wakefield on the mound here tomorrow afternoon against Mark Clark and Von Eshelman against Bobby Jones Sunday. Mac ran on a 3 1 pitch. Garcia Parra fouled it off. Might have chased ball four. That's one of the problems with running when it's 3 and 1. You make a hitter chase a pitch that's close that probably would be a walk. Should have took that pitch. That ball's out of the strike zone and back had a terrific jump. He'd have had an easy stolen base. If it's called a strike, it would have been an easy stolen base. Probably was ball four. Yeah, a lot of managers won't run on that 3 1 count mm -hmm. for just the reason you mentioned. And that's ball four. Rare walk by Nomar. Just the 16th time this year, 59 games, he has walked. Right fielder, Darren Brown. So two men are on to the Boston seventh. Manuel has given up a single and a walk in this inning. Bob Apodaca on the phone of the Mets bullpen. He's probably going to get a chance to face Bragg, but he won't get the chance to face uh, Vaughn, and that would probably bring on another one of those double switches.
Darren Bragg with two men on and two outs takes the ball low. Darren's 0 for 3 is struck out and grounded out twice. Ball too high. And Hundley trots to the mound to speak with Manuel. Ricardo Jordan. Just called up today by the uh, New York Mets as Trilicek was put on the stable list. Hmm. Red Sox probably sorry to miss their old pal Rick. Three and oh the count. Fans getting a little restless. One ball away from loading the bases for Mo Vaughn. There's a strike. Red Sox trying to add to this five to two lead in the seven. They've been out hit by the Mets eight to seven. Need the team's made an error and now it's a full count with two outs. The runners will be off with the pitch. Mack from second and Garcia Parra from first. One thing's for sure about this field it looks like it's in very good shape given that when it used to be a football facility it was Kind of a disaster. The runners go. Bragg sends it out of play to the left. For the two years that the Yankees played here at Chase Stadium when they were redoing Yankee Stadium, what a mess this field was because it was always baseball on it. It was uh, the Mets when they were home, and of course the Yankees playing their games here. And just an awful playing field. There's not much they could do. They couldn't keep up with it. Mets are talking about a new stadium, perhaps even a dome. Seems like every team in baseball is pondering a new facility. Just about every team that hasn't built one recently. Bragg takes strike three. Good fastball to the inside part of the plate. Darren knew it. So the Red Sox leave two men on. Seventh inning stretch at Chase Stadium in New York with the score the Red Sox five in the midst two. This is the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Dubai, Mitsubishi. By Bank Boston. By Honda, by Citgo, by Coca Cola, and by Mazda. I'm Doug Brown with a check on that Phillies Blue Jays game at the Vet. The Phils are finally on the scoreboard. It's an RBI single by Greg Jeffries to score Scott Rowland. Two to one Blue Jays in the sixth. Let's get back to Shea. Back to Sean and Jerry. All right, Doug, folks settling back into their seats after the seventh inning stretch. And it's Steve Beezer, a pinch hitter. Batting for the pitcher Manuel begin the home half of the seventh against John Wasden. He's in the top of the order Everett and Gilkey. These are a 267 hitter with four runs batted and he's been up 60 times with 16 hits. He's three for 16 as a pinch hitter. Mets pinch hitters have been outstanding this year. They're 25 and 94. And Beezer this one high in the air and deep to right. Bragg running out of room at the wall. Now he comes in a step to make the catch. Boston's major problem has been the home run ball, and that was very nearly another surrendered by John. Made a bit out in the right field. You look at the 358 out toward the bullpens. Now you think of Fenway Park, that's 380. At that area, so pretty shallow. If you can go right to down toward the lines here at Shea. Mm, these are very upset. 
Carl Everett the batter. One for three a homer on the first pitch of the night thrown by Supon. Since then he's lined to right and bounced to first. Supon worked five innings allowed two earned runs. On eight hits. Everett hits one a mile down the line. It's actually trying to slice back toward the pole. Ordinarily when a left hander hits it down the right field line it keeps hooking but that one looked like it was trying to drift back toward fair territory. This guy's got a lot of uh, action for a guy that has uh, six home runs on the season. It's a nice way of saying he's a hot dog. Yeah, I mean, you know, the collapse swing. Mm -hmm. He had that run around the base where he tucks that shoulder and toward the bag, uh, very similar to what Reggie Jackson used to do. Lance Jackson's a normal center fielder for the uh, Mets, but he's been on DL with the uh, chin splints. And this guy's usually a bench player. And he's going to do all the styling he can while he's out there. Uh oh. We might do some posing after this one. It's gone. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, there's the apple, and you get out the mustard as well for Carl Everett. It's five to three, a second home run of the night. All three runs for the Mets tonight have been on solo homers, two by Everett, one by Hundley. And a line drive home run this time by Everett. Line shot over that fence at 358. And then it all begins. The uh, tucked in left shoulder, the left hand close to the body, and as he rounds third, there it is. Let's practice that. Maybe the Red Sox should help him practice getting up out of the dirt the exactly. next time he's up. I don't think of what Bob Gibson might have done uh, after that act. Or well, a number of other pitches. Mm -hmm. He might have uh, needed to brush off the seat of his pants. Once again, the long ball bites Wasden. He's given up 11. Gilkey to right. Drag the running catch. Count it down around the knees. Gilkey's now one for three, and there are two outs here in the seventh. Everything's gone a right field in this inning against Wozniak. Darren Bragg in right field seems to have uh, problems picking the ball off of the bat. A couple of times tonight, he's broken back on fly balls, and it had to really come hard to make the play. So two down the bases are empty one run in here in the inning on the home run by Everett seventh inning five three Red Sox leading the Mets and John Olerud took a ball. Olerud's 0 for 3 first time up he lined into a double play. What a strike. One ball and one strike. Rounded up the middle. Valentin is there. And he throws him out. And that's all for the Mets in the seventh. They get a run on the second home run of the night by Carl Everett. With the score, the Red Sox five and the Mets three. We'll be back after these words from your local sponsors of all the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Shea Stadium the Red Sox have a five to three lead now over the Mets as we move to the top of the eighth join your favorite Red Sox players and personnel on the World Wide Web at www.redsox.com for the 1997 online chat series British of the Boston Red Sox and Fleet Bank. New pitcher for the Mets the third pitcher of the night for New York left hander Ricardo Jordan. Who was just called up from their triple day club in Norfolk today. Gordon started the season with the Mets and made 11 appearances. A record of 0 2. 4.50 ERA down into the minor leagues at Norfolk. There's 0 and 1 in 10 games. A couple of roster moves are made. They're disabling Alexander and Trilicek today, and they recalled Jordan and also uh, purchased. Uh, 
Kevin Morgan's contract from Triple A. Morgan's an infielder. Move on the batter, 0 for 2 with an intentional walk. Red Sox batting with a 5 to 3 lead in the top of the eighth. Vaughn narrowing and the pitcher was to do it. First pitch from Jordan, a strike. And a smash down to third off the glove of Franco. And out in the left field, that'll undoubtedly be scored a base hit for Mo. Now the Red Sox have the lead man on to the eighth. Not much chance at all for Franco at third base. That's a bullet by Vaughn. Let's see, you expect the left hander to pull the ball. Vaughn usually does not go on the ground to the left side of the infield. Most of the time when he goes to the opposite field, it's in the air. That just ate up for Franco and goes as a base hit for Mo Vaughn. Tim Nearing the batter. And that's off the mitt of Hundley, but not very really far behind on plate. Mo won't try to move up. Not the best tonight for Mo on the base pads. Uh, had that play early in the game at third base. And he was uh, caught with the infield in and got picked off third. And uh, this ball should be standing on second base. Ball sailing way away from the hitter off the glove. We see Mo does not get a much of a secondary lead. It's uh, pretty much the uh, one lead, no extra steps, and so it's tough to go to second base when you don't get that secondary lead. He also seems, Jerry, to me, to be noticeably slower than years gone by. A couple of years ago, he stole some bases, and I don't know if the knee's bothering him or what it is, but he really lumbers around the base paths now. I think his knee's bothering him some, Sean. He's not running as well, obviously, as he did a couple of years ago. You saw the other night when he collapsed in the batter's box taking a swing, and he says that he has problems on and off. Uh, might be a torn college. And I know what that feels like. You know, it'll just give away on you uh, when you're not expecting it. 2 0 to Nearing, fouled out of play to the right. Tim had a broken bat double down the right field line to knock in a run in the sixth inning. And he scored in the sixth. He's one for three. Red Sox lead five to three. They have the first man on here in the eighth. Mike Stanley has moved in the on deck circle to bat for John Wasden. Look out. Whoa, right here. You get a chance to get one up here, don't you? Yes, you do. Didn't think we could get one in there. Big gaping space through which to send a foul ball, but that one almost had the reins. Landed just a couple of feet below us. And you can see it coming all the way off the bat. It was pretty accurate missile. It's a little bit like the bunker we have in uh, Minnesota. Yes. Foxhole type boot. Red Sox are probably going to visit in this first year of Inter League play the two worst National League ballparks, this place and the Olympic Stadium in Montreal. Franco to Bayerga, and that's all they'll get. The ball, a high chopper down to third. Nearing safe at first on the fielder's choice with one out. And Vaughn erased five to four, and here comes Stanley to bat for Wasden. Chris Hammond is loosening in the Red Sox bullpen, so he will probably get the call for the eighth. And there is right-handed action in the New York bullpen. There's Chris Hammond. Stanley's raised his average up to 300 with a recent surge. Four homers, 24 runs batted in for Mike. He's running a season high five game hitting streak. Eight for 15 as a pinch hitter this season. These folks here now are making paper airplanes and trying to fire them onto the field. They're starting to dart down from every direction. 
Top down to Wendell Kim. Nice play by Wendell. Stayed down with it. Hopefully the planes next door. LaGuardia will have an easier time finding their landing target than these paper airplanes are. Most of them are crashing down on fellow patrons. In the right field corner, they are uh, starting to have quite a collection of plane crashes. They must have given these folks, maybe they're all star ballots. Something that they gave them when they came in here tonight, but they're now taking in the paper airplanes. Five, three Red Sox in the eight. All the dirt. Dug out by Hundley. Three balls, a strike on Mike Stanley. What could be advertising uh, how to pick up that 86 highlight film <laughs> that they've been showing. Oh, here comes one that's going to land down by first base. Buzz Nearing. Well, they're playing chin music. And he's got running the three run. That's toward the gap in left center. Everett racing to get it. He can't get it. And he won't style if he plays it off the bottom of the wall. Mary will score from first, and the Red Sox lead six to three. A pinch hit double by Mike Stanley, who continues to sizzle for the Red Sox. Well, he has really taken uh, to that pinch hitting role that he's been doing for the Red Sox all season. Stanley now nine for 16 as a pinch hitter. Line shot in the gap. This uh, this ball by Everett uh, should have been cut off. He just goes directly at the ball. And then has to chase it all the way back to the uh, gap sign. He takes a different route. He's able to cut that ball off and maybe have a play at the plate. Now the Mets will intentionally walk Valentin and pitch to Troy O'Leary. Valentin will reach base for the third straight at bat. He had homered and doubled, knocked in three runs tonight, two for three. Red Sox lead back to three runs, six to three. They answer the run picked up by the Mets in the bottom of the seventh with we'll one of their own here in the eighth. Jimmy Williams will probably not pinch it for O'Leary. The Red Sox have the lead, the, the best defensive outfield out there, and uh, obviously Cordero not at the ballpark tonight, not available. Only two right handers left in the bench, Benjamin and Fry, and of course Jefferson from the left side. Well, this is an instance in which not having Cordero hurts the Red Sox. He might be up there in this situation. Joined us late. Red Sox made the decision. Leave Cordero back at the hotel tonight. There had been a lot of speculation last night at Fenway that Cordero might be back in the starting lineup tonight. But that has not happened as he continues to deal with the aftermath of. The incident involving his wife after Tuesday night's doubleheader. First pitch to O'Leary, a ball. Troy, one for three, a homer off the starter, Rick Reed in the fifth. Stanley at second, Donaldson at first. Still only one out. Ball inside, and it's 2 0 on O'Leary with Shane Mack on deck. So Ricardo Jordan has not been sharp. He came over to the Mets from the Phillies in November along with Toby Borland. In exchange for first baseman Rico Borland. Toby Borland, that was quite an episode uh, with the Red Sox. Borland really struggled. One of the few guys you ever heard say yeah I think they should make a move and I'm probably the guy they yep. send up. He was uh, realistic enough to know that he was not getting the job done. Well it's now become a paper airplane festival here at Jay Stadium. O'Leary a tapper down to first. Gold the roof to the shortstop Lopez. He hangs on to it. So first Ladies and third and with two outs as O'Leary reaches on the fielder's choice. And the of New York, you are asked 
Oh, now the announcement comes. Not, so please not throw paper airplanes on the field. Some of the fans cheer the announcement. And some boo. Watch them come now. Oh, yeah. And it, <laughs> it has really only uh, spurred on the paper airplane tossers. Yeah, now it's become a game. You told me not to throw those paper airplanes. <laughs> Shane Mack takes a borderline strike. Shane's one to three, a single or center last inning off Barry Manuel. Some of these people, though, it's astounding how they can throw these planes as far as they can. They come out of the upper deck and they land a long distance away. Well, here comes one that may get the pitcher's mound. No, no, it's going to fall way short. What am I looking at? You have to play the wind direction. Red Sox lead six to three. They've scored a run here in the eighth to push the lead to six to three. Mack with a chance to do some damage first and third and two outs. He's in the hole 0 and two. And he pulls one down the left field line. It is hooking. It is a foul ball. Oh, by a foot or less. Mack making a bid for his second hit of the night. That right there would have probably drove in two runs for Shane Mack, but just foul. Another road two from Jordan. Mack a pop fly the other way, and that'll drift back into the seats. Let's pause for station identification on the 68 Sports the Red Sox Television Paper Airplane Network. We're grateful for the assistance of Christine Charbonneau and Jason Lewis in the booth here tonight, helping us at Shea Stadium. Sean McDonough with Jerry Remy. Interleague play. First game ever for the Red Sox and the Mets. In this era of interleague play, these games we played within three different blocks during the season. And the Mets really looking forward to their upcoming games at the beginning of next week at Yonkyu Stadium against the New York Yankees. Out of play to the right. Of course, the big draw for the Red Sox in interleague play will be the Atlanta Braves, where it's Fenway Labor Day weekend. Those tickets have been a hot commodity since tickets went on sale over the winter. We've come back in that game against the Orioles, now a four to three game. Uh, the Orioles leading the, the Braves. Ball just outside. So Mack is hanging in there. He got in the hole 0 and 2, and he's fouled off several tough pitches. That pitching matchup tonight at Turner Field was Jimmy Key and Greg Maddox. Baltimore leads Atlanta 4 to 3 in the bottom of the eighth, but it was 4 to nothing, Orioles. Mack puts it in play, and it should be an easy play for Everett. It is. The Red Sox get a run. They leave two. They've stranded five, but the Red Sox lead six to three, heading to the bottom of the eighth on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. On the Dunkin' Donuts scoreboard, heading to the bottom of the eighth. And while we have a moment, all of us involved with our 68 Sports Red Sox telecast want to send best wishes along and uh, say goodbye to Dana Belpedio. Who works back in the studio during these ball games and master control has done a terrific job in the year plus the ball games have been on 68 sports. He's leaving channel 68. We wish Dana well. Chris Hammond, the new pitcher for the Red Sox. Appearance number 23 on the season for Hammond, a record of three and three. 6.07 ERA. Hammond worked in the ball game last night against Baltimore, retiring both that as he faced in the ninth inning. One strikeout. Now Hammond's a guy I like to get to the plate. 
pretty good hitter in his uh, days yes. in the National League. 205 hitter with four home runs. Last home run he hit was a grand slam home run. Wow. Red Sox lead by three. John Wasden pitched two innings of relief, gave up just one run on one hit. Homer by Carl Everett. I always want to call him Chad Everett for some reason. <laughs> Todd uh, Hundley, Carlos Baerga, Matt Franco coming up. What was that show Chad Everett was on? The hospital show. One of those medical deals. Oh, yeah. Medical center. I'm not sure. I think the guys in the truck would come firing through with the answer to that. That's their era. They're a lot older than we are. Hundley is struck out, homered, and popped out. Actually, I'm older than both guys in the truck. Yes, but you're looking at much younger. <laughs> no tap dancing tonight, though. We keep waiting for your uh, tap dance debut here on 68 Sports. Mark Brandenburg, Joe Hudson, pair of right-handers in the Boston bullpen. It's not going to happen at Chase Stadium, I can tell you that. Might have to tap dance to dodge some of these incoming paper airplane missiles <laughs> and Hunley falls off another one and two on Todd I wonder what the fun of that is uh, sit there with your date and your wife uh, make a nice paper airplane and send it firing toward the field yeah, I guess you want to show off maybe how far you can get it to go. Maybe perhaps it's amusing when it hits somebody when down below. I don't think it would be particularly fun to get hit by one of them. It probably isn't a, an excruciating experience either. But I tell you what, if we get hit by one, headsets are off and we're going right up into the stands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yep. And I'm sure at least folks are quaking in their shoes at the thought of that. And Hundley goes down swinging a strikeout for Hammond for the first out of the eighth. That's the fourth strikeout for Red Sox pitching tonight. The other three by the starter Supine. Let's switch these uh, switch hitters around to the right side. Hundley with much more power from the left side of the plate. Only one home run hitting right handed. Baeger has been a much better left handed uh, hitter this season than right handed. Carlos is one for three singled to right field in the sixth. We're in the eighth. Red Sox lead six to three in this first in the league play game for the Red Sox and the Mets. Austin fell behind two to nothing after four. But Red Sox scored three runs in the fifth and two more in the sixth to grab the lead and they've maintained the lead. Edgar is out. That ball hit him out of the batter's box, and a good call by the home plate umpire Ed Rapuano. Rapuano, right on top of this call, you'll see by Edgar bunt and start down that first base line. He is out of the batter's box, and once that ball hits him out of the box, he is called out by the home plate umpire. Good call. Hit him out of the box in fair territory. No question about it. So two down in the eighth. And the hitter is Matt Franco. Franco's had a good night. Two for three. Couple of singles to right. The Mets is a free agent in the offseason prior to last year. Divided his time last year between their Triple A team and the Mets, but spent most of his time last year at Triple A Norfolk, where he led the International League in hits with 164 and in doubles with 40. Slashing, swing and a miss. He goes down on three pitches, and Hammond does a 1 2 3 inning. 
with two strikeouts. After eight, six to three Red Sox on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. A commodity is for you at the vet, brought to you by Bud Light. Bases loaded, bottom of the seventh. Greg Jeffries, who's had a big night, a two-run single to give the Phils their first lead of the night. All three RBIs by Jeffries. 3-2 Phillies now in the eighth. Back to Sean and Jerry. Thank you, Doug. Welcome back to Shea Stadium. Paper airplanes continue to make their way onto the field. Wow. That's quite a get up there. Works on Wall Street during the day. Yeah, and then apparently doesn't want uh, people to know he's a Mets fan. That's, uh, hmm. Makes you want to sing I Love New York. Corey Lytle, the new pitcher for the Mets. 14th appearance. You see, uh, Lytle has made one start, has a record of three and one, also has one save. A lot of hits, 25 hits in 19 innings. He was called up early in May from uh, the AAA club at Norfolk. They used to be the Tidewater Tides, not the Norfolk Tides. Will Hassam and the batter up for the second time of the ball game. He fly to center in the seventh against. Barry Manuel, Ricardo Jordan pitched one inning and allowed one run on two hits and a walk for the Mets. Red Sox batting with a six to three lead in the ninth. Hasselman, Garcia, Parra, Bragg do up. Well, that can be a hot, humid place in midsummer night. Norfolk with the tides play. Ooh, nice completion there. Dean, the bat boy, on the receiving end of the Screen pass from Corey Lytle. Breaking ball missed. But you worked the uh, International League, didn't you? Yes, I did. Corey Lytle was a quarterback at one time. Nice overhand delivery. Nose up spiral. Well, maybe Parcello might be looking for somebody here. Uh, Look for the Jets. Asman goes down swinging. They have a new ballpark there in Norfolk. When I was there, was Metropolitan Park. It was a dump. They didn't really draw anybody. It's really not a fun place uh, to go. One thing I remember is uh, the general manager of the team and the PA announcer were kind of large gentlemen. And about the sixth or seventh inning of every game, the queen inning, the team would be running off the field, the other team would be going out in the field. Be Gate out in the outfield would open. In would come a pizza delivery car. They drive right up behind home plate. The guy would run out, run up the steps to the press box, give these fellows their pizza for the night, and run back down and drive off. Garcia Parra fisted, lobbed it to first. Olerud made the catch. Two down. This copyrighted telecast is presented by Authority of the Boston Red Sox and WABU TV Channel 68. May not be reproduced or retransmitted. In any form without the express written consent of the Boston Red Sox, WABU TV. Another feature of that park, Metropolitan Park, is the press box was almost at field level, right about where that GMC sign was behind home plate here. There were about three or four rows of stands between you and the backstop, so you heard all the conversations. It was also very difficult to judge how far the ball was going. That one's going a long way off the bat of Darren Bragg over the head of Bernard Gilkey. And Bragg has his first hit of the night. Now one for five, a two-out double off Corey Lytle. He's been playing uh, fairly shallow out there in left field all night. Valentin hit a line drive over his head earlier in the ball game, and now Bragg going to the opposite field over the head of uh, Bernard Gilkey. He gets himself in a scoring position with two outs here in the ninth. Gilkey's a very good outfielder. He leads the National League in assists, as we mentioned earlier. Really he has eight. He has had his struggles so far offensively for the Mets, which was not the case a year ago. No. What was particularly distracting about that booth being at field level was those three or four rows between the booth in Norfolk and the field. Those were the seats where the wives or girlfriends of the Tidewater players sat. No Bond hits one to Tidewater. Way back and way out of here. He's on a home run tear. And the Red Sox are piling it on the Mets. It's eight to three. Number 20 for Moe. 
And now it's 44 runs batted in. That would have been three home runs for both sides tonight, but the Red Sox have had the big ones. A two-run home run here by Vaughn. This is a monster home run. I mean, even the fans here at the Shea Stadium are ooing and ooing off this one. That's a long way back to that scoreboard. Here's what I think should happen, assuming this game stays this way. Red Sox should take the tape of this game. First, it's a very historic game, big game, first Little League play game. Make a highlight tape, break it down individual little plays, and then next year when the Mets come, every half inning, exactly. scoreboard on center. Well, let's look back at the first Little League play game between the Mets and the Red Sox last right. year, and then just play home run after home run, base hit after base hit. Wouldn't have quite the effect of the early six World Series, but hey, we can make it that way. Play. Yes, we will. This has, it has more relevance now than uh, that did. I mean, there's nobody here from 86. That's right. Excellent point as usual by the Rundog. Nearing stepped out. Red Sox have uh, made their home runs. Count tonight a two run home run by Vaughn, a two run home run by Ballant, and the solo home run by O'Leary. All three for the Mets, solo home runs. Two by Everett and one by Hundley. Something going on down that right field line. Red Rob Urano spoke with the first base umpire Terry Tata. I think somebody has one of those lights, those uh they do it at Yankee Stadium once in a while. Those laser lights yeah. that they I try to shine in the eyes of a hitter or a fielder or a pitcher. Gehring slaps it out of play to the right. He's in the hole 0 and 2. Two outs in the ninth. Looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth. The Mets have the bottom third of their order due up. Ochoa Lopez in the pitcher. Red Sox have eight runs on 11 hits. The Mets three runs on nine hits. Neither team has made an error. And Marin goes down swinging to end the inning. The Red Sox get two more on the Mulvaughn homer. Heading to the bottom of the ninth, eight to three Red Sox on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Boston Red Sox are leaving it all on the field every game. Back at Shea Stadium, the Red Sox have the 8-3 lead as we move to the bottom of the ninth. Well, Fox will have game two of this series tomorrow at 1 p.m. and ESPN will have the final game Sunday night at 8. We'll be back with you Monday starting at 6.30 p.m. with On Deck. And your host Doug Brown then stay with us as the Sox begin a three game series with the Philadelphia Phillies game time will be 7 p.m. over most of our 68 sports television network. Does that mean a weekend off for the Rem Dogs? Sure does. And we're leaving right after the game immediately following the ball game. We're right out back. of Gotham heading right back up to the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Heathcliff Slocum the new pitcher ready to go to work to Alex Ochoa and his first pitch was a strike. Welcome in what is not a save situation trying to protect the five run lead. Not even now one ball one strike on a Choa who's two for three tonight. Welcome making his 29th appearance he has really struggled. Far too many base runners with the 39 hits and 24 walks given up. In 27 and two thirds innings. Time called. The object has come out of the field in shallow right. Oh. Okay. Can of soda. Yeah, this is a classy place, Shea Stadium. Tell you, this makes uh, Yankee Stadium look like it's a nice, comfortable little Little League game over there. <laughs> <laughs> Three and one, the count. Oh. 
Slogan really isn't the closer these days, and this isn't your typical closing situation. There's a chance to get him some work. A five run lead, but he might make it interesting in a hurry. Ochoa drives one to deep left, and Slocum's woes continue. That is a long home run. A three hit night for Ochoa. The lead down to four for the Red Sox as Ochoa has his first home run of the season in 127 at bats. And the way he uh, powered that one, you would think he'd have more than just the one. That's gone a long way. The last two home runs, the one by Vaughn and this one by Ochoa, just rocket shots. Fourth home run that Slocum's allowed this season. Fell behind three and one, the fastball, and uh, Ochoa. It's another solo home run, the fourth of the night for the Mets. Ochoa's fifth major league home run. And then it's a four run game. Still and the Red Sox have to find a way to get Heath Hicks Slocum straightened out. He's been dreadful almost the entire season. Pitching a Luis Lopez. Go for two with an intentional walk. It's Husky in the on deck circle when you're back to the pitcher. And Kyle Everett will hit again. Brandon Berg and uh, Hudson listening for the Red Sox. Lacey pitched yesterday an inning in a third. I think he'd be able to come back tonight and get a couple of outs if uh, they needed him. But you see Hudson and Brandon Berg listening up there for the second time. Strike three. Breaking ball. Lopez called out on strikes. And the first out of the inning. First strikeout for Slocum. Like the slider from Slocum picking up the outside corner. Pick up the first out here at the bottom of the ninth. Here's Butch Husky to bat for the pitcher. Husky, for a while, the third baseman, now the right fielder, batting 288, nine homers, 34 runs batted in. Two four is a pinch hitter. Both hits have been pinch hit home runs. The Mets have hit four pinch hit home runs this season. Just one of those players who wears number 42 in honor of Jackie Robinson. Looks like Mo Vaughn Husky intends to continue wearing it. Yeah, both have said they're going to wear it throughout their career, and uh, after they're finished, uh, that's it. Those who wear it currently can continue to wear it until their career comes to an end. Broken bad lob, and that falls in front of O'Leary and left. Well, if this continues, they might show that highlight film one more time here in the bottom of the ninth. Well, here's Kyle Everett. He might not have a chance to bat against Slocum. Everett hammering the first on the first pitch of the ball game thrown by Supan. And he held him again in the seventh from John Wasden. The only hit given up by Wasden in his two innings of relief. That one of a line drive variety. Jimmy Williams says Heathcliff, that's enough tonight. We keep hoping for the one outing that might get him started in the right direction. Tonight's outing. Does not qualify as that outing. Joe Hudson will be the new pitcher. We'll be right back into these words from your local stations along the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Get the final two outs of this ball game. Third appearance since being called up uh, to the Red Sox. His last was in the doubleheader game two against the Orioles. He tied all three batters he faced in that game, allowing no runs and one strikeout. That was on Tuesday night. He inherits a runner at first. And the pitcher, Dave Malicki, is pinch running for Butch Husky. Malicki, the pinch runner at first. Carl Everett bats. Two for four with the two solo homers. All four Mets runs tonight on solo homers. It's eight to four, Boston. Pitch off the mitt of Hasselman. 
Malicki in the scoring position. Well, it looks like Everett is uh, taking all the way, at least taking one strike. And right now, Hudson having a tough time throwing a strike. That pitch was up off the heel of uh, Hasselman's glove, and Malicki will throw up one base. So it won't be a double play that'll end the ball game. Dave Jell's positioning center fielder Shane Mag is very deep in center and over toward right. No word yet on the scoring decision, but whether it was a wild pitcher pass ball. It allowed Malicki to get the second. Swing and a miss. Hudson back even with Everett two and two. Bernard Gilkey on deck. Each team has 11 hits. The Red Sox lead eight to four with one out on the runner in scoring position in the bottom of the ninth. Ball three. The Red Sox fans know how tough it can be for Boston to get the final out of a ball game in the bottom of the ninth here at Shea Stadium against the New York Mets. Everett with a base hit through the hole on the left side. Malicki will be held by Cookie Rojas. Down by four. Cookie won't be taking any chances waving runners around. All of a sudden, the tying run is in the on deck circle for New York. And you're getting around to the big bats. Bernard Gilkey will bat next, then John Olroot, then Todd Hundley. Yep, one batter away from uh, bringing the tying run to the plate. And of course, those are the best two hitters on the team in Olerud and Hundley. I'll tell you what, it's become downright dangerous out in the right field for Darren Bragg. They have yep. been. They found another can of uh, soda at him. During our last commercial break, you get hit with a full can of soda from that distance out of the stands. You could be seriously hurt. Darren keeps looking over his shoulder up into those stands to keep an eye out for objects that might be coming at him. Well, the ballpark is a dump, and these fans behave like they're in a dump. Bernard Gilkey is the batter. He has walked, struck out, singled, and flied to right. Runners at first and third, one out. Double play depth for the Red Sox infield. Hudson misses up and in. That's not his game. He needs to keep the ball down. And he has control trouble and he does walk way too many batters usually it's because the ball's up and running all over the place as that one is most every pitch he's made since being in the ball game has been up well Chris Hammond had an easy one two three eight Jimmy Williams apparently thought with five run lead it was safe to bring in Heathcliff Slocum and now he has to sweat it out Hammond Struck out two last inning at a very easy one, two, three frame. Hudson might have caught a break. Yoki faced one that appeared to be about a letter high and fouled it off. Two and one. Looks like Terry Lacey is and now loosening up in the bullpen for Boston. Along with Brandenburg. Terry got what we both thought was kind of a quick hook last night. I mean, maybe that was the thought that he might be needed tonight. That's chopped off the leg of Gilkey, a foul ball, evening the count at two and two. And much to a better job the last two pitches, getting the ball down for Joe Hudson. There's a Lacey and Brandon Bergen. Red Sox eight, Mets four. One out, runners at first and third for Bobby Valentine at the bottom of the ninth. Joe Hudson pitching to Bernard Gilkey with the count of two and two. John Oldwood on deck. Low and away. Many of the fans on their feet now as Gilkey pulls one foul. Down by the four runs, they have Everett at first base, so off with the 3-2 count.
Another 3-2 with the runner going. He struck him out. Hasselman able to hang on to that pitch. Everett in the second. And now the Mets are down to their final out. A big strikeout for Joe Hudson after he fell behind to the count. Two balls and no strikes. He battled back. Sinker down and in in the foul tip. It looked like from uh, Gil Keel. A nice job by Bill Hasselman. A whole line of that foul tip. And big out. It keeps the tying run uh, from coming to the plate. John Olderwood takes the ball very high. Olerud tonight is lined into a double play, grounded out the first to pitcher covering, popped the third and grounded the second baseman. Hasn't had it out of the infield. Uh, Hundley representing the tying run is on deck. And that's biggest home run threat. Red Sox lead eight to four. Strike lifted back over the inner third. Everett the runner at second, the pinch runner Maliki at third. Two balls, one strike. Hudson, the fifth Red Sox pitcher of the night. Soupbond, Wasden, Hammond, Slocum, now Hudson with ball three outside, three and one. You got to throw this ball right down the middle of the plate and hope that Overwood gets himself out. That's something John, or rather Joe Hudson's had a very tough time doing in his brief major league stints. He can't throw strikes regularly enough. And we'll probably be Lacey with Williams. Sending his arm up over his head rather than indicating for the sidewinder Brandenburg. And Joe Hudson's been on the Boston Pawtucket Express a couple of times, and if he wants to stick around as a major league pitcher, he needs to learn to throw more strikes. He won't last long here with performances like this one. Eight to four Red Sox, the tying run coming to the plate for the New York Mets when we come back on the 68 Sports Red Sox Television Network. Stadium in New York with the Red Sox lead eight to four, but the Mets will get the tying run to the plate here in the ninth with two outs as they've loaded the bases and it's Kerry Lacey in to try to retire Todd Hundley. There is number 16 for Lacey, a record of 0-1, 4.32 ERA, 27 hits allowed in 25 innings. He has walked 10. He has struck out seven opponents hitting 273, and of course with a home run hitter at the plate. Lacey has allowed two so far this season. He worked in the ballgame uh, last night, as we mentioned, inning in a third. A couple of hits, two runs. They were both earned against the Orioles. And the Mets' most dangerous hitter, Todd Hundley, coming to the plate. Another shaky performance by Jimmy Williams' bullpen. Slocum and Hudson here in the ninth. They should not even be close to being in this position. Nope. And as you said, no excuse for walking Old Root. If he hits it out of the ballpark, you're still ahead by one. You have to make him do something. You can't give him a free pass and let this guy come up there. There's the tying run. And he is 44,443, the attendance tonight. A lot of them have left. Hundley earlier in the ballgame, homered off Supon, leading off the fourth. His only hit. In four trips, he has struck out twice. He hits a ground ball to second. Valentin throws him out. And this time, the Red Sox survive a tricky bounding ball on the right side of the infield in the bottom of the ninth at Shea Stadium, and they win the ball game against the Mets. Eight to four, the final. Well, the totals and more from Shea Stadium in a moment. The game is brought to you by HQ, HQ and nowhere else. Tonight's play, the home run by Mo Vaughn in the ninth inning to give the Red Sox some breathing room. Number 20 on the season and a monster home run by Vaughn. The Red Sox hit three on the night. The Mets hit four, but all the Mets were solo home runs. That's tonight's play of the game brought to you by HQ, HQ and nowhere else. 
Cab Cure, the association for the cure of cancer of the prostate, would like to salute the home run hitters in tonight's game. And there were a bunch of them. They combined to raise a total of $350,000 to help find a cure. If you'd like to help, call the number on your screen, 1-800-547-CURE. Totals for tonight's ball game for the Red Sox, eight runs on 11 hits. Without an error, they left five men on base. The Mets, four runs, 12 hits, and no errors. They stranded 10, including the bases being left loaded in the bottom of the ninth. Winning pitcher Jeff Supon, his first decision of the season. It's his third major league win, and the loser was Rick Reed. The Mets started now four and four. Kerry Lacey came in to get the final out for his second save. Time of the ball game, two hours and 55 minutes for a big crowd of 44,000. 443. Jerry said the Mets hit four solo homers, two by Carl Everett, the others by Todd Hundley and Alex Ochoa. The Red Sox hit three long balls, a two run homer by John Ballantin, the fifth, followed by a home run by Troy O'Leary, and Mo Vaughn's two run homer that you saw in the ninth put the finishing touches on the Red Sox scoring. So the Red Sox win the first ever interleague play game involving the Red Sox and the Mets. And they win their first ball game back in this park that meant anything since 1986. Once again, the final score of tonight's game is Boston 8 and New York 4. Fox will have game two of the series tomorrow starting at 1. ESPN will have the final game of this three-game series Sunday night at 8. And we'll be back with you Monday starting at 6.30 with On Deck and your host, Doug Brown. Then it's the first game of a three-game series with the Philadelphia Phillies. As interleague play comes to Fenway Park starting at 7 o'clock. Monday night over most of our 68 Sports Red Sox television network. Now for Jerry Remy, Sean McDonough saying so long from Shea Stadium in New York. We now return you to our 68 Sports studios. Here's Doug. All right, guys, thanks very much. To get the feeling, Sean and Jerry will just stick around to soak up the atmosphere. They enjoy the park so much down there at Shea Stadium. The Sox win it by a score of 8-4. to four. Our New England Toyota dealers player of the game goes to John Ballantin. He came up with two hits, but the big hit was the two-run homer that tied the game in the fifth as Rick Reed had pitched four and a third perfect innings to start the game for the Mets, but then a single by Hatterberg and the two-run homer by Ballantin. He later drove in a run with a double in the sixth inning. So Valentin now with 28 RBIs, a couple of hits. He's now hitting 257 as he slowly gets that batting average up there. Well, the Sox had the juice turned on. They now have won three in a row. They've scored 27 runs in the last three games. A little scary from the bullpen, though, in the ninth. Our next game will be Monday night when the Phillies come to Fenway Park. Red Sox on deck at 6.30 on most of these same Red Sox television network stations. Sports night next for those of you on the flagship. Good night, everybody.